Sorry, did you not hear what I said? No, it, your, your voice is a little bit more muffled now. Okay, we're having the fucking same problem. All right, I'll move. Like, I can understand what you're saying, but it's just like, um, it was much clearer when you first started. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm going to move out. So I'm going to move to the location we used last time. This is very frustrating. Um, That's much but, clearer. Okay, it's much clearer now. I'm going to put you... How does it sound now? Sounds right. Keep okay. keep talking. I'm going to leave you here, okay? That's where I'm going to leave my phone. Okay, I can hear it. Okay. Sweet. So, sorry, yeah, okay, I, I, was, I had my phone moving around a bit before, yeah, I have both the internet and the Wi-Fi, I mean, I have both the internet, right? I have both the Wi-Fi and the phone should pick it up if the Wi-Fi drops out, I don't know, I have three routers in this house, it's mm. very annoying that I paid so much for, like, ideal way to catch this internet and the internet, we shouldn't be trying to catch internet like it's a wild animal. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Living Off Borrowed Time podcast, an ongoing conversation about hip-hop and other things. I'm your host, Patrick McGovern, Patrick and RYM, joined this week by Patrick Sphinx from RYM, where we'll be going into a classic album discussion about Danny Brown's Triple X. We've been trying to do, like, vary it up. Sometimes we do our discographies. Sometimes we just do episode, general episodes. And this week we're doing one of our deep dives into an album that I think both of us feel very strongly about. One of the best albums of the decade. I think one of the best albums ever, period. Any genre, any, like, I'm just going to tip my hand on that. You're not going to hear anything negative about this album, period. I'll defend against some of the things that people have said about it, and Danny as an artist, but I'm not personally going to say anything negative about this album. It's been very personally significant to me, and I've wanted to talk about it for a long time, and I'm really happy to have you on. I know you feel very positively about this album, know a lot about it, so, yeah. Yeah, th- this uh, I also wanted to briefly mention um, uh, uh, one of my favorite albums, but also um, still feel it is underappreciated, even though it has slowly uh, but surely gained a lot of appreciation and, and, and critical praise. I still feel it's a little bit underrated. I would agree with you. I think it's a victim of Danny's overall success because of Atrocity Exhibition. Mm, mm, that too. And I'll also say that uh, uh, a trusted ex- exhibition, which is crazy, that was four years ago. Um, and I'll also say that has made people come back, revisit Triple X, and um, view it in in a different light and appreciate it and go to understand it. Most, I mean, he uh, foreshadows Atrocity Exhibition throughout Triple X. Like, that's a direct build to Atrocity Exhibition in a lot of ways, production, lyrically. Like, he's building a narrative. Like, he's like telling his life story on wax and atrocity exhibition is kind of the end point. And then, you know what I'm saying is kind of him reflecting back on everywhere he'd been like atrocity exhibition is the extreme end point of he starts telling it on the hybrid triple X is when he starts getting full success and you have little side stories like the mixtapes, like he did. It's an art with blue. He has black and Brown with a uh, black milk, black milk. Yeah. Which mm. is like, excellent. Like, he has, but like his general, like his album path, is hybrid triple x um old atrocity like that mm. and you know what i'm saying like that's the album path of his like that's the main story yeah 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 and he is a very um even though he has tons of mixtapes tons of stuff before 
Um, and I guess hot soup. Hybrid. We could also say hot soup is in that too. Although I don't know if he would consider hot soup. I've I not even considers hot soup. It's I've as not even heard an it. album, and it's very very good. But yeah, right. Okay, I got to check it out. I've not, I've not listened to that now. Nah. And you to be to hot soup. I've not listened to hot soup, and truth be told, I've only listened to the hybrid uh, maybe twice. And only oh, very, very recently. The hybrid. the hybrid is incredible. I rank it above old. I rank it above, you know what I'm saying? I really like both those albums. I've, I mean, the hybrid's what got me into Dan. Well, I guess this is a good segue into mm. first time you heard Danny. I think it's the same for both of us because we just talked about this in the Discord. It was on uh, JC Paid, correct? You know what? Um, it might be because <laughs> I was you, just going really? through my you just library. Swerved me. What the fuck? You set me up. To yeah, fail. I'm sorry. You set me up to <laughs> I'm fail. sorry. Fucker. It might be that, um, but uh, as actually checking, um, he was featured on the Fire remix with um, Elzai. I think the album The Preface came out yeah, in 2008. Yeah, I'm not a huge um, fan, so I mean, I've heard that on Danny Lucy. I mean, Elzai's cool, but I'm not like a follower. But I've heard that, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I think that was probably the first time I heard him technically, but first time I sort of paid attention was, yeah, Jay Stay Paid. Um, which um, reason I listened to the albums because because I was really getting to Dilla. People said that's probably um, one of, if not the only good. Um, oh, actually, wait, there was another one, but uh, one of the best uh, post- posthumous Dilla albums. The, uh, there are a few, but it depends on who's curating it. Dilla Troit is very good. Um, yeah. Yep. And Dillatronic is very good. Those are the three I would say. Other than that, it's all cash grabs. It got really yep. sad after a while. Um, I also yeah. really like the uh, Stray Phrases Donuts done in a jazz style album. That's excellent. Um, yeah, I have not listened to that, but I do have it in my library. Yeah. Right. I have both versions. I have the original time they did that in a nightclub. Somebody got a soundboard of that. They probably commissioned it. And then they did a <laughs> studio version of it. Both are very good. I actually kind of like the soundboard version more because it's cool. Like, I mean, it probably sucked for them when they were playing it because, like, you just hear people talking over it and, like, ambient sounds. But it's kind of a cool listening experience. Just hear donuts going on in the background as people live their lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely mean to check that out. Uh, But, but, yeah, yeah. the first time I heard Danny was also um, Dillabot versus The Hybrid. And he started showing up on the smoking section, TSS, as I abbreviate it, since you asked, which was uh, an incredibly it. meaningful hip-hop blog to me. The two that I checked the most back when I was checking hip-hop blogs all the time from about 2004 or five onward until the medium pretty much died fairly recently were Smoking Section and Passion of the Weiss. Both had a lot of Danny Brown coverage, and I think Danny himself was very instrumental in getting his name out there, being very internet-savvy once he got out of jail. And I forget, it was between 05 and 08, that's when Hot, Hot Soup came out, although I think some of it was recorded before, because he recorded that with Nick Speed, and there was talk of him signing the G-Unit. It's covered in the Triple X oral history that they do, which is excellent. It's on Passion of the Weiss. We're going to reference it a lot, because mm. they have both Danny talking about the lyrics and the producers talking about the beats and how they hooked up with Danny. And yeah, Passion of the Weiss is a big reason that I was hyped for Triple X, and also Smoking Section, because they would come out with Lucy's like a radio head, which is not a Radiohead sample, nor does it sound anything like the band Radiohead. It's just a filthy Danny Brown song over, I believe, a Skywalker beat. And shout mm. out to Skywalker, by the way. One of the best producers yes. who I think has gotten very like, very little appreciation because he hasn't done very much work. He's only really worked with Danny, Black Noise, and oddly enough, one or two times Childish Gambino. I think only on yeah. the fucking track he had with Danny. So it was probably a Danny song that he already had that Childish just hopped on. So... Yeah, I'm looking in my library, and uh, the only Skywalker credits I got is Danny Brown, Bruiser Brigade, and Triple Black as part of Bruiser Brigade. Yeah, he has not, but yeah, no, nah, um, we'll get into it. But yeah, he is very unique um, and fantastic. Like, well, ex- yeah, like, he apparently came into hip hop from I don't know if this came up in the oral history or not, but I definitely remember it from an interview talking about his influences and his process that he came up to it from one of those PlayStation two games where he made beats and he was like Mm. a guy and he started getting into hip hop and he started trying to like blend his influences of listening to metal by making metal influenced beats in those PlayStation two games. Wow. Okay. That I think you can kind of hear that a little bit in the ragged metal edge of some of the stuff he does, especially on 30, which is, Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can't wait to talk about the way that Triple X ends. 
I yep. really cannot. Yep. But, yep. Um, but yeah, real quick, uh, I think um, with J State paid, um, I think that that song in particular, that uh, Dillabot versus the Hybrid, it mainly stuck out to me because the title. Um, like I was just scanning through. I, I'm not sure if I've ever listened to this album in full, to be honest. Oh yeah, I love that album, by the way. Like I think that again, we were talking about like Dilla, Postum, Postumus, uh, Cash Grabs, and stuff. This was put together by Pete Rock. Uh, shout out yeah. to yeah. Really wish you had better views on vaccines, dude. Or at least <laughs> on fucking Twitter. But uh, Pete Stromano's three came out today. I'm gonna get to it later. I'm sure it's great. Um, but yeah, this album is like. Pete picked some really good unreleased Dilla beats. He found some really good MCs to throw over them. The blue track on here is great. There's a fucking Frank Nitty track that's great. Uh, 24K rap is like five minutes long. It's fucking awesome. Um, but yeah, the Danny track really stood out because you hear this for the first time. This dude just has this wild voice. And he's making these wild fucking references to like Pete and Pete. And he's like, yeah. you don't know if he, he stays on beat sometimes, but then he wild, like way off beat and just like staccato and like punchlines that I, I don't know. This was the first track I really replayed off the album. Yeah. So same for me, same for me. And, um, cause, cause I think um, probably the other reason, um, I, I got this checked out this album is because I saw, you know, it had blue, it had rake one, it had, um, doom and black thought. I was like, Oh, that definitely got to get this. Oh, yeah. Shout out to the black thought track on there, by the way, because at the time, not like, TV was so glutted, like every station had all this reality shit on there. And Black Thought does the best jizza, does a track with nothing but proper nouns verse ever on it. Just, mm. just dissects the shit. And you weren't living through it in America at the time. So, I mean, you probably think it's just like a cool Black Thought song. That song really spoke to me. And my wife got really mad. She was at the time, my girlfriend got really mad when I played it for her. And she's like, I don't watch that much shit. And I would name like five songs in there that she, uh, five shows in the song she listened to. And she, didn't really like the song and she loves like the roots and black thought so that song definitely touched a nerve just saying anyway yeah. continue digression but but yeah i i was just um i've i've, I've always loved um the song uh just how uh, he opens up with you know i, I break laws jaws and false promises, promises still living in the same yeah. hood where my mom is um but and then i always just loved that um but but then like um probably I never really up obama kids <laughs> yeah I, I i never really paid attention um uh, fully into the lyrics, but then I, um, oh, yeah. I, I, I like was still picking up on shit years later. Where it's like uh, your stash sound like the Nickelodeon theme song kid, where he's just saying you oh. get X, and then he sings the Nickelodeon theme song. That is <laughs> genius. Yeah, that yeah. Because uh, he mentions uh, yeah. You, did you get um, Daryl Dawkins was a player for the Philadelphia 76ers, Sixers who used to uh, break the black the backboard when he did slam dunks. That's what uh, I think. Okay, okay. jam. Right, yeah. So when he's yeah. fucking your bitch, he breaks the headboard. Just like okay. Daryl Dawkins I, would break the backboard. Yeah, I don't know a single thing about sports, but that. But the thing is, like, there's this hint of like he's so he's not ignorant, he's ignorant, but he's so clever. Like, oh no, just, th that would get to be even more emphasized throughout. Like he, right here in the first verse, I think he knew this was going to be like his big introduction to people, and he made it count. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's going over a Dilla beat. Like, he is on a Dilla album. You know, Dilla is Detroit. Like, he is... I mean, you've listened... You you said you heard all the other shit, uh, like, the main albums. Did you hear Detroit Sit Em On 4? No, I did not. Oh, listen you, you gotta listen to that, dude. That's him. It's yeah. all original beats. Bunch of Detroit MCs. He has, like, a line on there about, like, drinking a fifth, listening to Donuts. You really bought... Like, I think he spent a lot of time just smoking and drinking and listening to Donuts. Like, Dilla's probably yeah. meant a lot to him. So. Yeah, definitely. But one line that, that that stuck out to me, and and I only got it now, is when he says, <laughs> "He says I take a nigga out quicker than Adam Rib G. I make a bitch out of a nigga." I was like, "Oh my <laughs> god, that is so." All right, that's I'm so ignorant, but that is so genius. clever. I got to bring up some lines. Fuck it, we're doing. Yeah, it. like t taking the rib out of Adam. It, it, t take a nigga out quicker than Adam Rib. So taking him out, as in he's like knocking him out, but also like literally taking the rib yeah, out. Yeah, like take him out, like God bitch out of him. Rib to make a bitch to make a woman. yeah. I was like, wow, that is perfectly vulgar, uh, blasphemous, and hilarious and right. clever. He made something that was like offensive to everybody and clever as shit at once. Yeah, yeah. It's just so. So then, like, I was like, all right, yeah. It, and then he makes a reference to Jim Jones jump jumping the fence at the Rucker. Do you know what that is? 
I, I literally looked that up today, and there's a YouTube oh, video. Yeah, yeah. Jim, Jim Jones getting got, jumped. That was yeah. one of the first viral videos on YouTube. Was uh, Jim Jones didn't want to fight. <laughs> Jim mm. Jones really did not want to fight anybody. <laughs> yep. Couple <And> status. <laughs> touch mics like Macaulay Culkin. Oh, oh my god. Oh, that's so uh, cool. Oh. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then what is like um, a minute like Kim and Ray J. They that sound like the baseline and Dre Day. Bum ba dum bum 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 bum. <laughs> you bitch take it on her chest like a pom pom. I was like, oh god. Uh, but yeah, anyway, this is just one song. But yeah, so so this uh, this was technical my introduction. Well, either there was on the fire remix, which is just like you know eight bars, which are all right. That like it was pretty good um, bars, but this yeah, is like but a no, short. Who's going to hear that Elzai song versus who's going to hear this on an album, a post on a posthumous? I always suck at pronouncing that word. Posthumous the Dilla album. Posthumous, yeah, yeah. Uh, about produced by Pete Rock. Like, and this was the first one. Like, this was people. If they were going to check for a Dilla album after he died, it was going to be that album. You know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so this is um my introduction, pretty much. Yeah. And then um uh after that, so this was came out like around 2009. I probably heard it around like 2010, 2011, or something. Um, but yeah, then. I probably got into Triple X um, most definitely through um, your your boy Fantana, um, but uh, I just want to talk okay. about. Well, uh, well, we don't really need you know, whatever. Uh, he's 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 an introduction to a lot of um, stuff for a uh, mid twenties person like me. But real quick, I just want to talk about twenty eleven. I I think that twenty eleven is one of the best years for hip hop ever like um it is up there with like you know 93 and 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 94 i think those are the, the stereotypical yeah, i'm good terrible years. with years let me bring up the list because there's one specific album i want to bring up that makes triple x more significant for me but what do you want to bring up so 2011 hip-hop i feel like so december 2010 is when um my beautiful dark twisted fantasy came out right right and now i'm not in love enough i'm not in love with that album that's a conversation for another time but that was a huge album no matter what um no matter what people's opinions are um big part of that is because uh, i've said this again and again but it's because pitchfork gave it a 10 out of 10 pitchfork at a time is way more relevant back then than now still is but um they're a indie publication, of course, indie rock and all that sort of stuff. They cover hip hop, of course, but that was the first modern album. I believe they gave a 10 out of 10 for hip hop. So people were like, oh, wait a minute. Hip hop is art. You know, hip hop can be taken seriously. Hip hop can be read deeper into. And while not necessarily that album had an impact on hip hop artists, it did down the line have an impact on people like, you know, Drake and the Cuddies and the J. Coles and, and the Kendricks, you know, very distinct influence of those guys but it just felt like um in terms of people reevaluating and recontextualizing hip-hop past present and future there was a big shift in how the media and and people um saw hip-hop um and 2011 was that so so i'm just gonna name off some albums just off the top of my head that i can think of um you had danny brown triple x his breakout you had um, uh, Kendrick Lamar, Section 80, his breakout, and still my favorite of his. Um, it's a conversation for another time. We had Death Grips, Ex Military, their breakout. You had um, um, uh, Live Love ASAP, his mixtape, his breakout. You have Circus you had- Maximus by Morlock Dilemma, which is apparently the number eight best hip hop album of 2011, now that I finally got the chart to work. What the who the fuck is Morlock Dilemma? What the fuck is this crap? Is it is it non English? Um, um, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm not trying to yeah. get on another scene, but it's got. I mean, that's bad. Like that. That was. I'm sorry. That was. Yeah, we've got a bunch of uh, regional hip hop that I've not heard that all of a sudden like really hit and like, wow. Yeah, wow, there, there's 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 been um there's been updates to the rate of music. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I didn't notice. And then chart. Yeah, and and updates in terms of the the how. Yeah, we get from like. Eight, less popular is shit that i don't really know until 29 then uh give me my flowers by blue and exile which is an excellent album uh, yeah but you had shabazz ballas's black up um brick crit return of forever his breakout um all of these albums um that 
And then Milo, I wish you, uh, I wish my uh, my brother but Rob was, was here. Days, uh, was that down. the days, the EPs, the days EPs? The days, sorry. Days, uh, days, um, or uh, th- the things EPs, things I learned today, or I'm pronouncing it wrong. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, things that happen today, things that happen things tonight. Things that happen today, things that happen tonight. Yeah. No, so that, that's 2013. This is uh, 2011. Was I wish my brother Rob was here. Oh. Uh, that that makes that yeah. Honestly, I need to come back to that one because that one's like my least favorite Milo. Wow! Wow! Okay! Wow! Uh, we're not gonna I open need, this right now. I, I've also listened to it the least. Mm, yeah. No, nah, that uh, is. I just made a lot of noises I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> that album holds a very dear place in my heart. I, yeah, we're not I, gonna I, even honest, talk about I this. Mean, Probably the place that Toothpaste Suburb holds for me, even though I like a lot of stuff past Toothpaste Suburb better on a musical level. Level. Mm. But but yeah, and and just briefly, uh, previous to that, uh, twenty ten, you had Das Racist, sit down, man, shut up, dude. Um, they break out. Great. Um, Great. You had um, yep. Yeah, uh, you had um, oh, what else? But anyway, point is, and if if you really want to get down to it, you had um, Jay Cole's um. Well, you had Drake's take care. You can't really bring had... this shit up unless you want me to just go off a riff making fun of them, and I don't want to waste time on the episode about Danny Brown. Yeah, fun of take care and uh, my... Jake Cole. <laughs> I guess my point is is that although nobody has made the cover I wanted them to of the take care cover with Violent J, or the nothing was the same cover with Violent J. Where's my fucking uh... fan art for the podcast? Are you guys really fans? <laughs> yeah, Where are fans Some, someone needs to get onto that. But and Brian, previous to that, twi- draw something. Like, you, you don't produce the podcast anymore, Ryan. Like, get a crayon. Who am I kidding? Ryan's not listening to this. He doesn't listen to the podcast. <laughs> nope. That and, requires and, attention. Yeah. <laughs> and, and previous to that, 2010, you had you had Flucka Valley, Waka Flucka oh, Flame, no um, Little B. Wait, wait, wait. New York is 101. No, nah, no, nah, that's bullshit. Yeah. No, that's oh, that's on the section bullshit. page. But but I guess my, my point is, is that... Um, there was a lot of exciting stuff going on to hip hop around this time, and there was much, much more eyes on the stuff than previously. Previously, all this stuff where you it would just be hip hop heads exclusively, it would be very niche, and not even hip hop heads, more like underground or, or alternative backpacker heads that would be paying attention. Now, the entire world. Um, or the entire internet, all, the whole indie sphere, blogger sphere, blah, 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 all that stuff. They all had their eyes on it. And so what basically that meant is that the lines between mainstream and underground were being blurred. The lines between artistic and, and, and commercial were also being blurred. And you could have albums as crazy as, as, as you know, Death Grips, where you can barely call it hip hop. And they just shoot up in popularity and, and at the same time, you can have, you know, the Jake Coles and the Drakes or something like that, a bit more of a accessible sound also shoot up in popularity. And then you yeah, can I have someone in between like Kendrick. Was, I didn't mean to like step on your point at the end, but I agree with you that that was definitely the time where the mainstream was meeting the weird, where the internet had become fully at that point. The internet was not a niche anything there were niche spots within the internet the internet in and of itself was not niche therefore an artist blowing up on the internet didn't just mean they were a niche artist just because it was the internet i think lil b might have been the tipping point on that because lil b i'll say i think lil b was a niche internet artist who somehow managed to make enough noise on the internet to get noticed by the fact that i'm gay came out on a major fucking label yep i'd say little little b was the tipping point and Odd Future were like Lil B the and Odd Future, up. yeah. And I think that Lil B's career not so much, but Earl, like Earl and Tyler and Fra- more Tyler and Frank's careers are like that. The internet itself was legitimized as like a breeding ground for legitimate artists. Not that it ever should have been doubted for that, but yep. you know how the industry is and how yep. old people are. But yeah, and that's another 2011 um, Goblin. Uh, I do not like that album, uh, but that's most, another most important album. Most people don't. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, I but, can't. Uh, believe, I, but you know what's funny though is, like, I mean, I hate that New York is on the second page, by the way, because that's going to disqualify it from a lot of new people who come to our way. I'm going to look at the top hundred, and they're not going to listen to New York, and everyone should listen to New York. Um, yeah, New York is very New underrated. York, like, yeah, very misunderstood. Do you want to be the one who does the blue episode? Because I don't think anyone else wants to do the blue episode with me. I've only listened to 
like uh, maybe blue albums. Yeah. Okay. No one, no yeah. one's gonna do the blue or, episode with me. It's the same thing as the Charles Hamilton episode. Uh, <laughs> someday, someone will. Someone but, will. Uh, but um, on the list and better than Watch the Throne by several places is an MED album, and Hail Mary Mallon, <laughs> and uh, Max B and Serengeti and Hi Fi uh, low budget Hi Fi music. So. R- RYM has shit on Watch the Throne by some measure. And I don't hate Watch yeah. the Throne, but it's a good transition into Watch the Throne came out the same day as Triple X. And Did one it? of my good really? internet friends yeah. at the time, Raven Mac, pointed out that it was really refreshing. And this is something that Weiss got into more when Magna Carta came out. But you have Jay and Kanye with their one percenter shit. And you have something super, and this was Weiss's review of Triple X, super relatable, down to earth. You can, mm. well, even though Danny does brag on it, like his brags are stand up comic brags. Though the brags you talk about, like, they're sort of like escalation bullshit you talk about with your boys. They're not the sort of shit that you get from other rappers that are just like lifestyle you're never going to have. He's not rubbing your nose in it. Mm. And, and that's the thing. Honestly, um, Triple X, it, it, it's one of my favorite albums. It's, it's probably not in my top five or anything, but I still think this album is a masterpiece. Like, mainly in, in the sequencing, but also, like, I feel like there is sort of deeper reading that you can do with this album. Yeah. Because um, I got sort of going real quick back to my introduction. You know, I, I just sort of checked it out and looked at the cover. And I was like, the hell is this? It's, it's like a, some anime face or something with a Xanax tab in the mouth. And like a blood tear and and the font that just says the name and the t- title is triple x and then when I, I guess w- when i started listening to it i was like what <laughs> this cartoony voice and probably the closest thing to a voice this ridiculous and cartoony is probably like cypress hill or like the far side um or maybe even like camus um or sea ray sea oh. ray's walls from um deaf jux um but i still was like his voice is super cartoonish and his lyrics are ultra over the top. And But that's where I feel like the first sign started to show up to me, where it's like, his lyrics are so over the top to the point where like he's really, really straddling or blurring the lines between this is who he is and this is not who he seems to be or like this is a character being played or like there's something a bit more uh, like ugly and sinister uh, that's going on underneath. I felt like this album is sort of, in a way, holding up a mirror to hip hop as a whole, especially hip hop like around this time um, and and le- leading up to 2011. Uh, of course, before this, um, you had the 2000s, the late, the mid and late 2000s, which you know, coming off of the bling era, you had the ringtone era and the MySpace era and and the swag era, I guess if you want to call it that. That's that uh, the um around right around this time you know you got the Wiz Khalifas and um the I guess cool kids in in, in a way in in ASAP Rocky um but the um everything was swag this and swag that and and it is it was just like this strange boiling point of, of culture and hip-hop was more and more going down the road of like hip-hop is about you know the the stereotypes of you know ignorance and violence and sex and hedonism and all that sort of stuff that was still being pushed more and more in the face of everyone. So then come this album, Triple X, um, you know, which just the title itself, you know, of course, Triple X Roman numerals for thirty album about him turning thirty, but also Triple X, you know, Xanax bars and also you know sex and you know it's X rated. Like here comes this album that almost takes all this stuff that is glamorized in hip hop stereotypically, you know, the the violence and the sex and the and the drugs and just pushes it to eleven and just makes it for what it really is, like just gives it a huge dose of reality and just shows how like how disgusting and vulgar it really is when you when you become this detailed into it, when you really break it down um in first person perspective, but also like in in third person perspective uh and it's just like you just really see how depraved and and how 
how disgusting <laughs> how disgusting it can really be. Um, I mean, I would agree with you. I agree with you for the most part. Um, I think that he is definitely holding a mirror up to hip hop, sometimes explicitly, like on radio song. Radio songs, oh yeah, and like a parody. I think he's holding a mirror up to himself, and what he sees in that mirror also reflects back hip hop. Um, it reflects back society. It reflects back his upbringing. You get the dose of reality and the final third. One of the things I thought about when I re-listened to the album was one of the things I say in my um, review of Mad Villainy is that one of the great things about it that makes it timeless is that you can view its sequence in any way that is like taken as a whole, 24 small parts, like a three act structure, whatever. I think this album's the same way because I was like, oh, these three tracks work really well together as a little trilogy. Oh, these two have great transitions. Oh, this is a big story from beginning to end. I think it's about Danny's struggle, but I think it's also about Detroit. I think it's also about where he grew up. I think there are little short stories within it. I think there are parts that are just dumb for the sake of being dumb and funny for the sake of being funny. I think there are punchlines on here that are just fucking stupid and irredeemable, but the only redeeming part is that they're fucking funny and Danny is great at wrapping them. I think there's all of that wrapped in the fact that it's a greater statement overall. Like that's what makes it transcendent is that he's making greater statements. Like in and of itself, it's a great rap album. Like he raps stuff on, he like the rapping on this is another level. Like the way he raps, the way he uses that voice, like that voice that is so annoying to people. Like, like think about what other rappers have voices that were are, like right now. Think of a rapper that has a voice that's annoying. Like, how do you feel about West side gun? Um, is that the do 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 guy, yeah, right? Is. That's I the guy. Do 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 boom. Yeah, him. Like I said, um, I, I might have said this before, but I have not given Griselda a fair chance. But from what I've heard, I'm just like, I, I, I have this personal thing. I have a lot of personal pet peeves. One of them is any artist that is too prolific. I, I just start to check out. I'm just like, well, I mean, Danny, you're releasing, and you obviously haven't listened to even like I'm the I'm kind of the opposite of you, which is weird. It's like I'm like I welcome that. Like I don't I might not yeah. check out everything, especially if it becomes like obvious that you're just kind of a content factory and you're just like rehashing shit. But if like you know, Mad Lib is the ultimate example of that in the 2000s. He put out so much shit, and there's value in all of it, and a lot of it's very different. And, but that exactly that's the thing. A lot of it is very different, and you can tell he 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 has concept he has concepts when it comes to projects. Is he's crafting projects? He's not just um, dumping this, um, putting a random title on it. Dumping this, putting a random title on it, and you can shift shift verses here and there, and shift beats here and there. And there's no there's no real difference. No one would be able to pick up a big difference. Um, but yeah, going back to cartoon voices, um, like I said, I only, I only recently. Um, uh, realize these comparisons with just Cypress Hill and Fireside. That's the first two that came to mind. And in the Fireside, um, again, oh, yeah. one of my favorite. Where's the Fireside comparison? I think everybody in Fireside is much smoother than, um, I mean, I kind of hear a, a little bit of What's Up Fat Lip and the way Danny is like very candid in the way What's Up Fat Lip is, and that's one of the oh no, nah, not, not pop song too that doesn't get enough credit. Not Fat Lip. Um, so who, the four guys, I think there's Slim Kid Trey, Rudy, Fat Rudy Lip. Brown, Slim Kid 3, Fat Lip. And Imani. Imani, so, yeah. Um, Booty Brown and especially Imani. They, um, if you've listened to, um, what is it called? Cali- oh, not California Cation, whatever right, that one. Sec- California. Yep, so their second album is way more mature. Um, but the first album... Al- um, yeah, I've, I've not listened to that album quite a lot, to be honest. I'd like it, but um, Bizarre Right to the Fireside is one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, that album is probably the closest thing to Dan and Brown in terms of cartoonishness. Like, they have a Yo Mama okay, song. That's a, yeah. So you think Bizarre Ride is the closest thing to Triple X? No, 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 no not, oh, not the Lab closest Cabin. thing. You think Lab Cabin is the closest thing to Triple X? Um, I, no, no, no. What I'm saying is, in terms of that cartoony voice, um, in terms of a voice that cartoony. Yeah, um, I don't see it. Like, oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about Lab Cab in California, right? No, no, no. Um, bizarre ride to the far side. Oh, that's what the, I said at uh, first, and you said no. Oh, sorry. I, I might have misheard it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I said. Yeah. Uh, so you think Bizarre Ride is the closest thing to Triple X in terms of like a bouncy cartoony, cartoony voice? I can hear it on some tracks, I guess, because some. Yeah. What about Grave Diggers? 
Um, yeah, a little bit. But in terms of that high pitch register, um, Imani and and um, Booty Brown. Yeah, um, I, I can hear that. Especially Imani. If you listen to uh, the song Your Mama um, by okay. The Far Side. All right. As usual on this podcast, I got schooled because now that I think about it, I hear it more than I think about it. Um, yeah. Uh, about E4, well, how much? And E4 then Cypress Hill. Uh, Cypress Hill, Hill, yes. And he even did a song with Be Real on um, Atrocity. So he definitely That's acknowledges true. that. I think, yeah, Be Real was a big influence. Yeah. So th- those are probably the only ones that came off the top of my head in terms of sounding like, in, in terms of having that. That weird high pitch register and 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 really cartoonish person. Oh, those are the ones that come to mind. But uh, but still, not none of those are quite as com- combining those voices and the changing voices and the change. Not only the changing voices, but the changing flows, the changing demeanor, um, the the changing uh, rhyme schemes, the changing um, subject matter. N- none of those are quite like that. Bizarre ride to the far side. Like the title says, it is quite a bizarre ride. There is like some hilariously childish tracks, like your mama. Then it switches to like cartoonishly horrorcore um, um, songs, and then it has like real, really somber, like um, personal tracks. Uh, that, so that is, I guess, in a way, bizarre to the far is probably closest thing, but not in terms of this downward spiral of drugs and sex and alcohol. Definitely not. And this per- this personal. Um, Definitely not. No, I don't uh, think content-wise there's ever really a hip-hop analog to this. Um, no. I mean, DMX kind of got into the mental health issues, not so much the substance abuse issues, but the way he presented it was very much in a traditional rap album format. The way he rapped was very different, so that's not really comparable. Um, I think Danny has a lot of influences. Like, how much E-40 do you know? Because like, on the very last track, he definitely does an E-40 thing. It's a uh, been a long time on a rocky road had a hoodie on in the jacket and the snow. that's like totally e40 right there oh, right. and like he did a song uh for the money i believe with e40 later like he definitely acknowledges that so like that's another west coast regional influence kind of like be real like danny's like danny i think one of the reasons he really resonates with me he's a total music nerd like obviously like he post-punk is a touchstone although i think people on rym overplay that just because the title of atrocity exhibition but Yep, yep, one hundred percent agreed with that. Yeah, he he, I, I did try to um, I was googling briefly his influences, um, and he's one of those um, that, that every now and then you get these rappers who they don't cite other hip hop artists as their influences. They always cite like like he he did cite some post punk. He said talk, Talking Heads, um, and he mentioned um, uh, System of a Down. Saying there's one track on there that is very much uh, Remain in Light style. Um, dance in the water on a, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, you know, is that you know? No, that's on a trophy no, exhibition. Trophy exhibition, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, he he, you can definitely tell, and and that's and that's the other thing that w- when I first listened to this album, it really threw me off. And um, I'm like, is this guy serious? Is he being sincere? Is is he being ironic? Is he being satirical? But I guess the answer is all of the above. Um, but I guess mainly, um, this was also. Um, I think, as I mentioned in the episode with um, the, the, the Jeff Def Jux albums, this is also the period where I was like, you know, very anti-mainstream, and to me, mainstream was hedonistic, and underground was, you know, real and raw and all that. But to me, this is an album where, to me, another thing that is, reminded me a lot of is Little Wayne in, in terms of a little bit of the cartooniness, but also in terms of how over the top and like explicit it is, where like a lot of those. Um, sexually yeah. explicit lines is very I mean, much Little Wayne. Particular is definitely he and Lil Wayne have at least one interest they share. So, yep they <laughs> they definitely do. But but yeah, so so I was sort of well, initially okay. Kind of, so Triple X, the first well, so the first time you heard it, did you hear it when it right like directly when it came out, or did you wait a little bit? Because I heard it the day it came out. Not I I I heard it. Um, at least the week that it came out. Uh, Cause I remember I was like, Whoa, you can download albums for free. Like artists are releasing, releasing albums for free on the internet. Well, was Danny like, was all like, I think atrocity was the, oh, I'm sorry. Old was the first one. Old came, um, old came out. These both came out on fool's gold, but this came out as a free mixtape. And then there was a deluxe version that came out with an EP that we'll get to at the very end. Cause I don't feel yep. like, I mean, I'll talk about the bonus tracks at the very end, 
but because I don't really like to do the track by track approach, but I feel like with this album, because it's telling the story, you can do the track by track approach. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so when he comes into it, it's like the beat is so. Well, you didn't hear the hybrid, so this is different than when he's rapping over on the hybrid. But the voice didn't really throw me off because he does the abrasive voice stuff on the hybrid. He would like he does the same thing on the hybrid where he starts off with the abrasive voice and then he kind of starts doing a more traditional rapper voice. It gets more dramatic on this album because he's become a better writer and I think he knows when to change his voice for dramatic effect. But again, I think you should really revisit the hybrid because it's a remarkable album and it kind of sets up concepts. That, well, he said the hybrid was more, oh, well, in the Weiss oral history, he says the hybrid was more overtly conscious, which is a funny thing to say because I think the second half of this album, or at least the last third, is pretty overtly conscious. I think also, um, yeah, so I, I've listened to the hybrid a, a couple of times, but um, yeah, I need to really visit it. But I think also, uh, the the word conscious um, sort of well, get used. He doesn't use that word. I use that word because I'm lame as fuck. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but he, I guess he um, said like street issues. He said like the specific issues. Like on the hybrid, you have Generation RX, Generation Prescription. Um, he talks about that. He talks about teen pregnancy, which by the way has only ever come up on like I think Brent is having a baby is the only other song that ever dealt with that. Like teen pregnancy in general is not something that and he does and Danny does it with way more nuance. Like, that's the thing, is Danny gets, like, a lot of shit for just being, like, oh, like, he's misogynist, he has all these sex songs, but he really actually has a greater understanding of women than more people ever give him credit for. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, um, that, yeah, definitely. Um, I want to say there is probably a, quite a few teen pregnancy songs, but um, uh, nothing off the top of my head, no, but, um, but yeah, it, like it, nothing, nothing, nothing that not explicit. Your work. That's not cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's um, quite a few, but I can't remember them. So you're wrong, but I can't prove you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong, but I'm not going to put the effort in disproving it. So just check my word for it. I mean, that's but, um, the internet. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, but I think yeah, it, I think probably yeah. what it is is I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say maybe the hybrid is more like this is a topic that I'm going to talk about relating to this general social issue. This is the topic that I'm going to talk about relating to this social issue. Whereas triple X is more conscious in the way of like introspective and self-reflective, but he is also doing those, you know, crossing off different topics, but yeah, it's much more I think that triple X personal. Is more, he does it through the lens of himself. There's one exception that he does in the middle of the album where he talks about a specific character but I feel like that is only, I think even that he's like kind of transference, the concept of transference. He sees himself in that girl when you get to party all the time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's so right. the only yeah. reason you have nosebleeds is so we can do party all the time where he's like looking at her. Like he's in the, like it's first person on nosebleeds and then party all the time is Danny. And he's like all saying that shit about a girl, but really he's saying it about himself. Yep. That's right. Yeah. But but even even like on the first track, Triple X, um, like the uh, it, and the other thing um, that I read is that um, he was very very purpose, purposeful with the sequencing. Like um, oh yeah, that was like yeah, the transitions meant a lot to him. Like I think that's why the whole sequence with um it was actually my least favorite sequence on the album before, where it's like the Bruiser Brigade stuff through to Adderall Admiral. Like I was like, this is the least lyrical stuff on there. In retrospect. First of all, no, because the punchlines are the best on there. And also, Detroit 187 has a nuts Danny verse on it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Danny verse on Detroit 187. And both the Bruiser guys' features are hilarious. Yeah. And and that's the other thing with, like, the first, you know, you can sort of divide the album into two halves um, with DNA starting the second half, um, like side A, side B says. But but even in the first half where it's, it's, it's much more braggadocious, it's much more explicit, it's much more... Um, violent and, and sexual, but even he he has a lot of flashes of like what's come, what what's to come. He has a lot of flashes of like oh, no. disturbing. Like, even I will like I noticed this when I was listening to it today. At the end, of I will is like I'll fuck you for an hour off a pill because I can't feel the last line. I, lit- I can't feel. I literally wrote that down. I was literally going to mention that. Yeah, yeah. I'm swagged up. I'm off a pill. Can fuck you for an hour because I can't feel. I was like, whoa. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was literally going to say that, yeah. And this is where, like, the those seeds started, like, more and more listening to this album. I was like, wait a minute, no, he, he's not, 
you know, it's not just side A, side B, you know, strictly like this is for the this is for the club or this is for the strip club, or this is for the hood, and then this is for the conscious heads or something like that. Like it is super well thought thought out. Like um even on Triple X is almost kind of like a reflection of the last track thirty. Well, obviously the Roman well, numerals, yeah. but also I mean, yeah, it kind of spells it out by having them be mirror images, the Roman numerals and the uh, and anglicized however you want to put it the regular numerals but yeah and even like musically they're kind of mirror images of each other with having the most rock metal influenced skywalker beats on them and mm. and even like like just like the transitions like the first lines his his it's very braggadocious about rap skills which is you know his like cold um uh colder than Called it, then the grits that fed slaves. Me, me to rap is like well, water like to water raves. raves. AKs with bayonets on set. Rep, or AKs with bayonets on deck. Rep my set. So what I like, square word with his clarinet. And uh, yeah, so, it, mouth, but she fantasizing, scaring. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna do it. Like I yeah, said, but, I wasn't gonna do too much Danny Brown voice in this episode. That's gonna get us a lot of But yeah, it's hard to resist. But yeah, like he goes from transitioning from bragging about his reps and then bragging about his skills with women. Uh, and then immediately he says, um, "Dark nights, um, stomach, yeah, on dark fire, nights fire, stomach on fire, stomach on fire." Delusion. So I couldn't get tired. Yeah, yeah. And and then like then he's talking about like the equalizer going from green to red, and and then sort he's of talking like about Neo the with the matrix code. Like music yeah. is what's saving him when he's writing this. He sees the ones and zeros. Yeah, it's like line from like like every two bars is like addressing a theme in the album, but also like going from bragging about rap, bragging about women, and then talking about drugs, and then bragging about this, bragging about that. And, and the thing about is, drugs. his brag raps, his punchlines are so fucking good, so funny. Like, I was still laughing at him like I heard it for the first time today. Like, they're so good, but then that makes it so jarring when he takes you out of it with something very personal. Mm. It's like, yeah, it's like each other line is like, it's like multiple gut punches. <laughs> it's like every every other line is like a gut punch. You're like, and, and this is what, like, it really threw me off, because I'm like, yeah, he sounds cartoonish, and he's rapping about these, you know, some of the stereotypical uh, mainstream stuff, you know, very little, little Wayne-esque stuff, but there's something else going on, and is this really him, or is this guy on the second half him, or, or is it all him, which, like I said, that is well, sort of the answer. Well, one answer. of the things that, to bring up a topic I'm sure you don't care about in pro wrestling that they like to say is... When you're really good at a promo, which is when you do an interview that's supposed to talk people into coming into the building to watch you pretend to fight another man in your underwear, is that you are using an elevated version of your own personality as the character. The best version, the best characters are your own personality elevated. And I think mm. that's what Danny does as a rapper. He's telling you his own stories. He's investing them with details from his life, but the way he raps them, it's an elevated persona. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that that that's a that's a perfect way to put it. And even like um, when when you go further in, like uh, you know, second track and and third track, um, uh, like die like a lock, like a rock star is of course you know he's that's where like you start to see he's starting he's starting to do like the sort of like the de glamorizing of you know drug use and abuse, uh, but it's still not completely morbid. Like the 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 the, the concept is you know. I'm a die like a rock star. It's like, yeah, like it's sort of like a take on like, you know, party like a rock star, which I think came out a few well, that years. That was ago. actually, yeah, that's a direct reference to, I think it was Shop Boys or something. And they did a song where they're like on top of cars, like Pharrell in the nerd video, uh, party like a rock star doing like air guitar and shit, like the whole trope. And yeah, so it was a very popular song at the time. So it's a direct reference, but what makes it great is you can still relate to it this time later. Who remembers party like a rock star? Nobody, but die like a rock star lives on. Yeah, yeah, and then it like he manages to like it includes um like you know you know mentions um, you know Brian Wilson, Chris Farley, and Jimi Hendrix and Basquiat and uh, River Phoenix and like Heath Ledger, John Belushi, Brandon Murphy. Like he mentions all these people, um, where like <laughs> you know they they live that rock star life that he kind of sort of glamorizes in some tracks but not really but the mainstream does glamorize all the time but he's just like slapping your face with reality by bringing all these like court case examples um i guess uh but still 
I guess I don't see it so much as like a slap in the mainstream, although yes, it is like inadvertently possibly because the mainstream does present these things in a way that glamorizes it only to shame you when they die. Like they just want clicks. Like it's clickbait. Like even before they were clicking, it was clicking. It was clickbait. It was just, you know, put your chat, like your clicker, I guess even it was clickbait when, cause your parents call it a clicker, your channel changer, your remote on the channel because, you know, we glamorize it when they're partying and then when they die, we run a memorial special, right? So, mm. like, so yes, in an inadvertent way, but I think he's really just talking about himself. And if you read the Weiss thing, he says that the rock star stuff came from documentaries and then the celebrity stuff came from, he said, like, Wikipedia can be very helpful. So he just kind of, like, filled it in with the rock stars he was interested in and he, read, and he like, watched movies about and then found out celebrities kind of fill out the bars. But it works in so much in context because it's just, like, these are all people that, like, their rises were so brief. Like, they're all young people in the song. Like, Chris Farley, Brittany Murphy, River Phoenix. They're all, like, 27 club people, I believe. Like, mm. they all didn't live till 30. Like, yeah, that that's right. It's an intentional reference. Like, you don't have anybody who died at 50 or 60. Like, he doesn't, like, and he doesn't make any cliched references on there. Like, it's not like, he doesn't do a Jim Morrison thing. It feels like the the weirdness, the obscurity, like Frankie Lyman, like how many other Frank, like I don't think only Cool Keith has made a Frankie Lyman reference, I think on sex style. Um, so yeah, I, had, yeah. I had to Google, I, had, I didn't know who Terry Driver was or, um, um, I mean, I've heard of Anne Nicole Smith and, and Keith. Anne Moon. Nicole Smith was kind of a big media deal here, which says a lot about America. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, I'm kind of familiar with some of these, but yeah, it's just sort of um, putting in all these examples. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's still yeah, there, there's definitely a very um, kind of ironic and uh, but also like you know really dark track. And of course, the the beat Skywalker. I think this is the uh, yeah, this Skywalker. is Skywalker, and it's just super menacing. And what I, one of the things I love is like the vocal production on it, like. They only really use distortion on Danny's voice sometimes, but he makes his voice sound so menacing that when they use the distortion on it, it's not that different. Like, he keeps making his voice sound more demented and more unhinged when he does the die like a rock star hook. Like, it ain't really a hook. Like, it, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's Skywalker super dreary. Yeah. It's for the second track on your album, like it gets dark and then it breaks right into pop blood, which is one of my favorite rapping performances he's ever done over like one of the most played samples. But he does this with a fucking, I believe it's fleet foxes or it's some indie band. I need to bring it up. I had it up actually. Fleet but, foxes. Yeah. yeah yep. Fleet foxes. And cause everyone had done Nautilus before, but Brandon Deshay manages to flip it in a way that sounds completely fresh. And yep. some of these punchlines are <laughs> ridiculous. I yeah, and and uh, but but the, that's the other thing. That's where like you also start to see like this dude can rhyme like on a technical level, and which is perfectly fitting because this you know song Park Blood, you know, it mentions Tupac in the, in the hook, but it's all about writing. It, it's you know meta rap. It's rapping about rap or rapping about writing more specifically um and you know he includes you know references to Maya Angelou and Re Rudyard Kipling and Bukowski Langston Hughes and Shakespeare of course and, and Puck yeah. but like you even like like um like when it says um one writing scriptures bring tears to the princess every time I end it every you can see the intent leave it in bent in every, every sentence like this guy's spit like like he's you know, he deliberately tones down the voice on it. And if you listen, uh, the, again, the Weiss interview, he says he didn't want to put this on here because he thought it was just bullshit. Like, wow, really? He didn't really think that it fit on the album, but like it kind of does fit because the second, third, and fourth tracks are all based on references. Second tracks, all celebrities and rock stars who died. Third one is all like authors and like is literary references. And the fourth one's all radio rappers. Like they all mm. go together, they're all reference raps. Yeah, he yeah. ties them together kind of about his life and his state at the time. And then yep. you have like the hedonism shit that starts with I will. Um, yeah, uh, no, with um, Lie For, actually. Lie For and I will goes through the hedonism shit, which gets gradually more ex like, you know, it escalates until it starts to just peak. And then he pan then he just crashes and has to take Adderall to get back up and starts reflecting on himself. And all of this, because of the success that he's gained, he finally made it when he thought he couldn't. 
Like he's telling yep. his own story and everything he tells about himself reflects something back about society all over these fucking instrumentals that are just like he met like in terms of like a cherry picked rap album. Like I know you like to talk about how life after death is one of the worst things that happened to hip hop. Like, <laughs> cause it was, yeah, cause it's just cherry picking producers and all this shit. But like Illmatic was cherry picking producers and this is the same thing, but it's like, it's cherry picking producers to a cohesive end. That's what's yes, wrong. yes, exactly. Yep, I, I was just about to say that. I think Elmatic sort of pro- popularized the one rapper, multiple um, um, super producers thing. I want to say that, but yeah. and um, Ready to Die as well, because Ready to Die did have multiple producers on it. Although it was yep. like you know Puffy EP that in a way where he was engineering it to an end, but still. But yeah, those yep. two, I would say, really. I don't know what Pac had. Like, again, I'm really, I really am going to need to like listen to Pac for the Pac episode because I'm not really up on Pac. But yep. And sorry, just real quick, I want to clarify. Ready to Die is one of my favorite albums of all time. Life After Death is one I don't like. Um, no, I, I was clear about that, but I, I okay, wanted to clarify good, good. that Ready to Die did the cherry picking producers too. But Life yeah. After Death is the one that you really don't like. But they both did the same thing. Life After Death like amplified it to ten and popularized it. Yeah, yeah. That, and, yeah. But exactly, it's exactly what you said. The multiple producers, um, you know, got Brandon Skywalker, Frank Dukes, Paul White, uh, Quell Chris on one, on one bit, on a couple beats. Yeah, Quell, um, Quell Squad was doing B. interesting beats. Like Quell with really like the ones that I thought were Flying Lotus. Yeah, yeah. Um, even DJ House Shoes. Uh, so you got all these people. Uh, but yeah, this, exa- yeah, I don't even want to look into it because it'll be more research. And I've actually done a lot of research for this episode for once. Yeah. But um, but yeah, House Shoes, I don't think, was really doing any beats at this point for anybody. And he did uh, Nosebleeds, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah but it's nosebleed. exactly. Yeah. It's very it's exactly what you said. The, the, co- the cohesion of the sound and not not just the cohesion within the album, but also fitting the mood of the tracks. Like, yeah, that is the, the exact way that you do it. And he he pretty much like Danny Brown with the producers like he pretty much maximizes like I don't know like everything you can do with a rap album like you said um, it's personal it's it's meta it's looking at things as a, as a macro looking at things at a micro level and um, giving you every side of his story and other people's stories even and also the stories of you know writing the process of writing the the his background his his life currently and his um, life um, it really previously. fits in every mood because I was riding around today and I'm in a good mood and the weather's great and I was bumping it and I was singing along to it in my annoying ass Danny Brown voice that nobody ever needs to hear in their life and the car and it was fun <laughs> but if I'm in a shitty mood and I listen to this album the same tracks they're going to hit me in a different way and work just as well because mm. he engineered this album that well because it really comes from all perspectives yeah and this is another one of those albums where uh, yeah, exactly. Like you said, different days I have different favorite track. Like sometimes it's radio song and life, or other times it's Brisbane Brigade. Other times it's you know Fields or um. um oh yeah, even, Fields. You know, I want to. I could talk about Fields forever because Fields yeah. is just like, oh my god. Uh, one of the things that Danny I noticed about Danny on this album, first bars. He has some of the best, most grabbing first bars on Money Talk Only Broke People Listen. To poor to pay attention ain't got a pot to piss in. Like, yep. holy shit. Yeah, he knows how to hit you from the beginning. But, um, yeah, um, sorry. Uh, the, I just want to, yeah, um, real quick, uh, Radio Song of Life for those. I think Radio Song was my fa- my first favorite and still might be still well, one of my favorites. because you hate the mainstream. Favorites. You keep mentioning a thousand times how you think this is a reaction against the mainstream. And that's the most well, like, obvious reaction against the mainstream on here. So it, it is, It's the most obvious satirical um, track. But I just like this is where like, uh, first of all, it's really catchy. So that's why I came back to it a lot. And, it got, you know, it's very earworm. But this is where like I was like, OK, I get it. And then made me uh, re-listen to the album and then dig deeper and but just like that beat is so comically sparse like it's you know it's just like yeah it's like almost the piano notes coming in the, on the hook are almost sarcastic yeah yeah <laughs> it's sarcastic production but you say yeah. you want to hit all righty yo single they say it's called commercial because it's called a jingle <laughs> yep it's my radio sound <laughs> uh, yeah it's just 
Yeah, it's so hilariously minimal. Um, and then once again, switching between like really hilarious, disgusting line to like really poignant line. Um, like like it says, like uh, what does it say? Like um, yeah, like she want to ride the wave, watch him do my swag, surf, party like a rock star, never bought to make it make a purse. Yeah, songs with no feelings, but she feel my thing on her. Like just that that one line, like songs with no feelings, is like he's like acknowledging, like you know, these songs have no no emotion or con- uh, you know, no. Yeah, you know, like his thrust, like one of the but she feel Raven my thing on her. Yeah, I keep mentioning Raven Mac in this episode, so I'm gonna try and get this episode out to him so somebody can hear it because I've shouted him like six times. Is one of the reasons people call Illmatic their favorite rap album of all time is because any DJ could take any one lyric on that and make a scratch out of it at the time. I think mm. that if people were still making scratches out of rap albums when Triple X came out, any one lyric on this could be a scratch. Any one lyric on this could be a scratch right now. People are still doing that because Danny is ly- writing on this and delivery on this is so sharp that any one lyric is resonant and funny at the same goddamn time all the fucking time on this album. And any one lyric can be a scratch on a party, ignorant as song, or like a really like a tough braggadocious song, or like a you know real you know hood like reality rap song like yeah you can use like, it in different contexts the amount of shit he manages to touch on like and like the visceral details like i said shit but he like talks about how on the one song he talked about i didn't have toilet paper i had to wipe my ass with wax paper and then on <laughs> another song he talks about how she didn't have tampons she used napkins like he uses really visceral details that you're going to remember and he wraps them in such a good fucking way that like they're throwaway lines for anyone else. Think about like any raps, like think about like even a rap album my life, like the two chains album that just came out. Like there are a lot of good funny lines on that. You probably hate it. Think it's stupid, whatever, but there are probably a good, like decent amount of lines on that. He has a ton of throwaway lines on there. There are zero throwaway lines on this album. Every line on this album is a fucking killer. Every line yep. you're going to listen to this and find a new favorite line every single goddamn time. Yep, and and that's the um, yeah, and straight going from radio song to life for um, which is another like uh, very much more obvious um, satire. But oh man, I, I just love that song. Like the fact that he's got like a, a like a two two choruses, uh, like you know one one is uh, one chorus. Income like, tax, swag. Yeah, yeah, swag. Yeah, like like the first like you know like one one. The first chorus is about his bowling and how he's like, why do I have to lie? And, and like, oh, um, you know, I'm taking yeah. all your hoes. And then next verse is like, yeah, um, nah, nigga, I'm lying. You know that I'll be frank. Got that income, uh, income tax swag. The bag dame in my lap just scoffed her back. Like, he, like the self-awareness and like like the, the set. Well, like he said arts. there was like, he only gave that to Skywalker so he could see if he could do something on a grime beat. And there are two grime songs on here. There's that in Detroit 187. And this one's probably the same. And Bruiser Brigade, too. Well, no, yeah, that's Bruiser, another. I guess. Okay, three. Because, Bru- well, I think Bruiser is more proto-trap, but... Yeah, it's it's um, a bit more... Um, uh, I mean, mock-up. it's still definitely something nobody was doing then, for sure. Yeah. Oh, he, well, does well, that, he does more like Bella regular punchlines. I feel like he does more punchlines on that. This one's like, like just more like straight-up regular punchline bars, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, His delivery is definitely different on this in Detroit than on a lot of the other tracks on the album. No, yeah, and yeah. I'm not disparaging this one, but I think lyrically, this is the one you could say that is his last, like, his least, like, lyrical, like, in terms of flow or whatever, is probably the simplest. And, like, but on the other hand, the overall concept is very clever. He pulls it off like crazy. It's funny as fuck, and it's really fun to yell along to. And I think it's a universal sentiment. Like, maybe mm. not for you. I don't know how taxes work in Australia, but we really like getting them <laughs> here. Um, which is weird, because even people who hate the government and, like, you know, fucking libertarians still probably go spend their income tax check. By the way, if you're a libertarian, you can't listen to this podcast. I don't know how I said <laughs> that before, but you're on the spreadsheet. Just throwing that on there. Um, yeah. Fuck yep, you, I, I got I got my personal thing for libertarians to yeah, um, but uh, yeah, now nah, at the uh, tax and income tax, I guess is inevitable like death. Um, but yeah, nah, uh, just hilariously genius. And then of course, um, uh, Skywalker. Um, I love the strings and like the buzzing bass and the 
all these other strange weird effects like it it's it's like all like a lot of these beats are like fairly um minimal like they they're made up of a few elements but like it just works and i guess um there's only some sort of a yeah, specific most of limit. the beats are minimal except for really nosebleeds and unless you want to consider the bookend beats minimal or not because they're more like rock beats and they have a lot going on in terms of instrumentation like 30 yep. and triple x or like they're layered in terms of like putting on noise and nosebleeds is kind of like how shoes did like a sample and kind of lets it play out and there's a lot of layering to that beyond that it's kind of like loops that are minimal with like drum loops on top of them yeah yeah it's done yep. so well oh i guess the uh, paul white stuff i don't know adderall admiral is minimal but there's a like it's minimal in a way where it's got like seven things going on somehow the yeah, uh, we'll, we'll probably get to that, but um, but yeah, we'll get we'll get to that again. I'm getting out of sequence, but yeah, um, lie for um, we're going from lie for to uh, what doesn't he have to lie for is that he will what you won't do, he will, yeah, oh, will he? <laughs> and uh, this, this is I love how the beat is like, of course, you know, the song is you know, I'll leave, leave it up to you to figure out what it is, but I love how the beat is like sinister and kind of creepy and ethereal kind of in a way and like he just goes into such graphic detail where it's like i can't think of why a chick would want to hear this song really like i can't well, see I think how it's not would... necessarily for the women although when he did put this out i do remember gene gray put on twitter i will song of the year so it did work for some people. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a I, like speaker. Every because... rap album has a song about how chicks want to give them blowjobs. So, mm. but but I guess my point is like, it's, this is not a strip club banger. <laughs> like, you wouldn't pray, play this song in a strip club. Oh really. no! If you like read the again the Weiss thing, um, Squad of B is like, I didn't think Danny was gonna go here with this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I this beat. I was really surprised. This is where he went with it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but. Uh, it's, yeah, it's hilarious it's... honestly though like and not in any comment whatsoever on what is advocated in the song which i fully co-sign um i if there was one song i skip when i listen to the album is this one mm, yeah it it depends but i don't on... really skip anything when i listen to it but i'm saying if there was one skip on the album it would be this one okay right for me um it's um i don't i don't know it's much later in the track and i don't know how much we're going to fight over this but to me it's e w n e s w east side west side yeah i know i think that's too essential to the second half and i really it is on that but i can oh, see where you're coming from oh. because it's kind of hitting the same beats as fields and fields hits the same beats much better but mm -hmm. i see that's not uh, to me it's, it is the hook and you don't yeah. like the exhaustedness of the hook i that hook is so annoying. I, you know what? It's, I don't it's find it annoying. slowly growing on me. It's slowly growing on me, but yeah. He said, he said. Okay. I, I love the way he says Northwest and he's so exhausted. Like, I love that's like the nuance in Danny's voice that I really love. Like, he has so many nuances in his voice. Like, that's one of the reasons he's more, like one of my very favorite rappers. So, yeah, I, I really like that track. I didn't even know that was him on the hook until <laughs> fairly recently, to be honest. I didn't realize, I didn't realize how much. Um, of like some of these hooks and stuff are and and like ad libs and that don't sound like him are actually just him. I was like, oh well, obviously, of course, that's just him. That's just him. That's just him. There's not actually that many other voices on this album, but uh, yeah, he was but, yeah. very careful to make it be like just him and his boys, like pretty much. Like he got them a spot and himself. And yeah, and young and cheesy. Nip, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Your which which rapper. makes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, if we're doing a Jay Z episode, don't count me in. I won't. I can't promise no, I'll make I, it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to hear your opinion on the gospel. Well, he didn't do a gospel album, but he did one where he had like church people come on and talk about how Jay Z loves Jesus. God, just. Anyway, it sounds really up your alley, so you know we'll call you for that one. But um, so you no. know, we get into the bruiser portion of the album, which is two tracks. Um, so we, I, I think Detroit One Eighty Seven is easily the better of the two. Hmm. Yeah. 
Oh, the you, you mean because like, I mean, I mean, it features Brizzard Brigade people? Yeah, I was a bit confused. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I love both. I'm much more of a fan of Brizzard Brigade. Oh, no, Brigade I like both a lot. Like, I think it's I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan of Chip or Chips or whatever. Chip Dollar Sign, his verse. It's fairly standard um, hardcore. Yeah, well, he's um, not the one who says I'm higher than Swiss Beats hairline, right? Exactly, and that's a... Dope has has that privilege, so yeah. that automatically wins. Yeah, Chips is very standard issue. Like as far as like uh, Danny's crew goes, Chips is the one who's kind of like a weed carrier. You have Dope Head, and then you have Zalooper. So Zalooper's is super interesting. I would do an episode on his shit. Actually. Yeah, he's I, not on this album. He would fit in perfectly. But sadly, I, not. I saw Zalooper's um live because uh, my cousin oh, opened fuck. up. Yeah, my cousin opened up for um, Zalupers and Danny Brown. So Zalupers opened for Danny Brown. All right. Well, now you can no tell one tell fuck- no no no. You got no. Okay, you can't just drop that item and not tell a fucking story. You gotta explain everything. About that. <laughs> well, my my cousin raps, uh, which of course you know we're black, so he raps. Uh, but I got a cousin that raps. But is that he he opened up for him? He opened up for Odyssey. So I, I had a chat and I took a photo with Odyssey backstage. But anyway, uh, yeah, he opened up for Z Loopers, um, and Danny Brown, and man. The energy when Z Loopers was on stage, non existent. No one, none of, <laughs> none of these white Aussie people knew who the hell Z Loopers was. And then yeah, when, I mean, when after. I don't know if he played at a show here either, sadly. Like, I mean, he's very underground. I mean, I'd go and, to see him, but I'd probably be the one person. I don't even know any of the words to any of his songs. I just like his music. But shout out this to was, This was before this was between old and um uh, so he didn't even really have anything out yet either because i think he had like two tapes one of which i can't well, say the title of on here but yeah like um yeah like at this point he's just like i mean you gotta put your dudes on though like you gotta have them tour and get experience so but. this was this was when he released um i think it was the help mixtape so 2014 i re- i i li- really i haven't listened to the whole thing before but i really loved um a few songs from it but so i was the only one who was hyped and then after um he finished his show um and he didn't even like go backstage or anything like um he was just chilling like on the couch like in the right in front of the bar like where they had like the water um jugs and stuff so he was just literally sitting by himself on the couch so i was <laughs> I, I went up and talked to him and this guy's tall like he's like seven foot dude or something yeah he, i'm sure he's seven feet yes yeah and so I, I was just talking to him and 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 um look for a very short time and then like taking photos with him and i was like hey oz and stuff like that um but yeah like <laughs> and, and then um um i can't remember where i was but yeah um dope head um, when I first listened to um, Barista Brigade multiple times, I just assumed that was Danny Brown. Um, and a lot of other people did. Like, um, I saw comments when, like, oh man, when Danny Brown said, um, I'm hired in Switch Beats Airline, that's his best ver- um, line. Um, and I was like, no, wait, that's not him. Like, especially when he very first starts, I was like, I need some brain. I think I lost mine. Like, he sounds exactly like Danny Brown, but like, the more he goes into his verse, um, it, he. Like you can tell, it's a different guy. Although I'm pretty sure it's Danny Brown's cousin. I want to say. Yeah, I think uh, they're cousins. Um, there are some verses he does where he sounds just like Danny. He has the same ability to uh, switch his voice, though. Like, like yeah, Zaloopers. If you get nothing else out of this episode, check out Zaloopers. He charges way too much for his music on Bandcamp, but you can stream it for free on Spotify. I've bought one or two Zaloopers projects. I bought Wildcard on Bandcamp. Um, stop with the rare art pricing, guys. Like, at least let people stream, like, buy it for 10 digital. You can charge whatever you want for, like, bigger projects. I'm not going to tell artists what's to charge for shit. I don't need any more fucking people to get mad at me. All the Makami fans hate me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, yep. I, sorry, just last thing I want to say about Zulippers. I think um, uh, I really love this song, Plateau. I think it was off the Help Mix type. And I feel like Zulippers sort of scratched the itch that I was missing um when post old came Dan, out post oh yeah you're gonna say post triple x danny like you think that he kind of yeah did. i could Between, see that actually yeah, yeah. He takes, like the yeah because i think His, danny, like, after triple x kind of he did change i won't say he i certainly won't say he sold out i think he changed his trajectory i still like where he went for sure I mean, triple x is one of my favorite albums of all time i love old i love every track on old save for one so love hope but um you know <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, uh, Bruiser Brigade uh, and Jethro and I said, a lot of these tracks, but yeah, Bruiser Brigade uh, has to do it for me because I remember pl- blasting this song with my mates in the car and um, you don't the McDonald's drive through. So you don't mind that he associated being gay with watching soccer. <laughs> yeah, okay, you know what? You know, I, was just, I, was, I wasn't going to bring that up, but now that you did, okay. I thought he said, yeah, no bottles at the club, nigga, we at that bar. You gay niggas up in the pubs, were they watching the soccer games? Okay, Rap Genius says, he says, you K niggas up in the pub, they're watching them soccer games. I can I've see been... that, but except he says F word, uh, and um, I think uh, either Outer Space or there's one other song later where he's like, fag you, uh, not, you don't play baseball, you always at the ballpark. But I can see you K at the i can see the same thing also i'm trying to quote things without saying words a lot here so it's just making me sound stupid like i'm radio editing myself but uh yeah, yeah. but I, you know that, what i'm saying like, i feel like it could be taken either way and also i don't think it matters necessarily it doesn't diminish my enjoyment of the song whatever it's an ignorant ass song if he said an ignorant thing in an ignorant song it doesn't really fucking bother me that much yeah it doesn't bother me but i thought i thought he said that and i read the lyrics and then I was like, eh, I guess. I mean, they, I, mean, I like the visual gay people of love like soccer. The people just trying to watch soccer games in a club, and then Danny and Zaloopers and uh, Chips and Dopehead bust in and play Waka Flocka and kick them out. <laughs> like they're just trying yeah. to watch soccer, and they just kick them out. <laughs> yep. And this interlude. Oh my god! I remember at this ex- the, um, when we were, I was with my friends blasting the song. My my my, my friend oh, was yeah. driving. He kept on wanting to turn it down, and I kept on smacking his hand and turning it up. <laughs> and as as we got to the McDonald's restaurant, right we were making our order. This interlude came up, and there's a poor girl who was serving us, and I blessed this up. And the interlude played, and she was just like staring at us. And my friend was like so embarrassed. I mean, you know, this was 2011, so I was in my uh, very early slash um, t- 20s slash late um, teens. But this is like the perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of um, when I was um, one of the people who was renting a house and we were having a house party and they un- unwisely gave me control over the music and for some reason I thought people wanted to hear Capadonna's The Pillage and uh, I guess um, the what? end of the f- yeah, uh, okay, uh, okay, that's bad enough but the end of the first track of Capadonna's The Pillage has a kung fu skit where it ends on uh, the end of the first track, Slang Editorial, which is a classic song, don't let anyone ever tell you different, ends with a, um, a movie skit where uh, two badly dubbed dudes talk about killing and raping. Mm, classic. Yeah, um, the room cleared really quick, and um, <laughs> I didn't make a lot of friends that night. And I was never again allowed to put my iPod on the fucking stereo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay we all have that um that moment i'll, I'll make sure to listen to that track uh, um village is still an eight by the way you know shout out to capadonna track on the new mugs album mm, i'll check it yeah, out definitely you believe me uh, no 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 it, it's more of a interested in what a dusty hmm. like capadonna yeah yeah he's a He's so weird, isn't he? Uh, but yeah, <laughs> Detroit, Detroit 187, um, love that beat. Um, like I said, meh, chips verse, to be honest. Uh, but some interesting lyrics that I've picked up that is like, it's like a brief window into like the mental state of Dan and Brown, but also like doubles it. Is, is it this where it says, um, I'm so institutionalized. Um, I wake I, up at 6 a.m. I'm looking for the chow line. Uh, and I, I wake up at 6 a.m. because I think it's chow time. Chow I don't know. Time, it, yeah. I, I don't know. This is what the lyric says, but it sounds like chow line. Anyway, and then he says, borderline, pure, borderline porcupine, a step from drinking turpentine just to wash down a plate of whack rapper's rhymes. So it's like, you know, um, wash down a plate of whack rapper's rhymes. That's just like a typical brag. But then before that, he says, borderline porcupine, a step from drinking turpentine. It's like, whoa, hang on. Wait, 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 back up. What was that? <laughs> it's like, you know, borderline porcupine. It's almost like, you know, the hedgehog dilemma where the closer you get oh, to you something. Oh, you think Charles Hamilton? Are you trying to start a uh, brown Charles Hamilton beef? <laughs> Wait, what, what, what do you mean? Uh, you said he was like like porcupine hedgehog. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry. Hedge, sorry, hedgehog dilemma, um, which is like 
the closer you the closer you get to other people, the more you feel like you're hurting them, or the ma- the more they oh, hurt you. Oh, I think. Oh. I thought you were saying you said it was like a diss track, and then you said hedgehog i thought you were uh, never mind i misread that. oh right now nah. <laughs> you thought it might have been like a code like um, a subliminal Charles Charles Hamilton. Hamilton. i'm like I don't no know. no no but, but i guess yeah say so first he's talking about borderline porcupine a step from drinking turbo time so it's like he's talking about i think it's called the hedgehog dilemma where it's like you know yeah like the the closer um it's like about like no, people who are introverts or people who have like social anxiety where they feel like the closer people are going to get to them the more they're going to hurt them like a like a porcupine i've or, never or heard about that but that's like uncomfortably familiar to me so i, I wouldn't yeah. about that um, <laughs> I, I apologize and then right after he says a step from drinking turpentine says so like whoa like his you know like drinking turpentine to you know well i mean there's a lot him. of suicidal ideation on this album i mean it ends with him like thinking he overdosed and it starts with him wanting to die like a rock star so that just yeah with that so but then right after that, he switches to drinking turpentine to wash down a plate of whack rappers around. So he's like, I was like, uh, oh, no, like you just about to get a glimpse and nope, um, switch well, I mean, back, change I think topic. I really good about that, though, where it's like he'll give you a glimpse, but then he's like shifting modes because he doesn't want to be that like it's um the very first verse of uh, Till the Casket Drops by the Clips. Have you ever heard that album? Probably not. Uh, by by who? Sorry the clips till the casket drops oh right and uh, no i've not listened to yeah that. no it's uh put your t talks about like uh how he's gonna play the role of common on his d-boy where it's like um speaking this truth and rhyme no matter how no matter how bland it is because his mm. critics always criti- criticize him for always talking about cocaine so he talks about conscious things the whole time and then mm. now and he ends it with my critics of mine finally have a verse of mine to jerk off to <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, so it's like Danny's trying to avoid that. He's not going to give you that conscious J. Cole verse. He's going to give you like little bits and some and otherwise verses where he's doing the same old shit where he's great at that. Like he's great at punchline raps, but he's also great at like giving you little personal details. And he just like that's why he's a hybrid. He splinters them, he sprinkles them throughout. Yeah. Yep. No one yep. else is bad enough to do that. That's why he's unique. Yeah, and and yeah, the fact that he of course changes his voice and his flow to add like another dimension to that, uh, like the changing mental state or the changing or the multiple aspects of his persona. Um, it, yeah, it. This is the one, genius. by the way, where he talks about he didn't have toilet paper; he had to wipe with wax napkins. I think Genius has this wrong, but you know, I am not a Genius member, nor will I ever be. So I'll defer to Genius. They were wet napkins. That makes it sound more disgusting. Why would he wipe with wet toilet? <laughs> Genius. And yeah. <laughs> then he does a um, metaphor for his life, which is kind of brilliant. Like that's super brilliant. Like you have know, the disgusting visceral thing again, visceral language. But then he's like ties it up. It's like I'm just kind of talking about my life. I had to survive. I had to take something that I wasn't supposed to use and use it to survive. Yeah. Smear up the classifieds. Okay, I just got the like the classified ad <laughs> newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The job. Um, ad. He's not going to get yep. a job. He wipes his ass with your job. Yeah, that's oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, genius album, genius. I'm just going to every randomly say um, every now and then say genius just because it is. Uh, but but yeah, we like genius, even though we use it. Oh yeah, and we're on genius.com. I, oh, wow. Okay, I'm a poet, and I didn't even know it. Uh, but yeah, moving on. Um, uh, yeah, Monopoly. Um, Another oh, great drum, song, the, Quail the, Chris. The fucking break in on this, the sample, the little like. I mean, I thought that was again like Outer Space is apparently the fly low influenced one, but this sounds to me like Flying Lotus. Like the way this kind of comes in sounds to me like uh, like Los Angeles era Flying Lotus, like the drums. Mm, right. I I didn't really get that vibe, but mm, okay. This also has some this of his is, funniest fucking lines, by the way. This is like some of like he's like a goddamn joke machine on this. Ready to hit the studio and shit only a mixtape, nah, literally, literally shit on the mixtape. Mix yeah, wipe with the credits of staying on the jewel case and just two takes, dog. The booth will be souffle. You hide something like a toupee. Truthfully, Ooh, my uh, friend, Tuche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 even like. 
the rhyming like the hybrid smoking up a pie they give you niggas bronchitis or what your right is well vagina what our right is well at china nigga uh, that's great like today, eight, with, eight, with the eight. vagina line is a double entendre because what do people call vagina walls or the size of vagina walls like so uh, this shit's soft like vagina walls his shit's the wall of china yeah <laughs> that's great oh wow wow genius <laughs> <laughs> Nigga, that's great. Like, hey, it's a great. Hey, it's gave me stuff in my suitcase. Yeah. And then he literally yeah. shits, literally shits all. I always love the literally shits all over your birthday <laughs> part. And also, I love it. To call out to, um, I don't know if you, there's a camera on track called That's Me. And that's where the, who's the little bitch? That's you. You must suck a lot of dick. That's true. Oh, my God. How's that Cameron? Yeah, that's Cameron. It's called That's Me. It's like the one who, the, it's like a, Who's the one with the whips and chips? That's me. And like he does the whole thing. I'm already blowing my flow on this. Also, I realize I back up to a like trail right now. So people can call the police on me anytime recording Danny Brown lyrics. So I should really not do that. I should not be telling people they suck a lot of, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it. this is, of course, the Cool Ranch Doritos line. Oh, and- yeah. He ruined Cool Ranch Doritos for me for the rest of my life. Yep, and one of my favorite lines that really exemplifies where is like, I'm a smart nigga that do dumb shit. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's like, that's Danny in a nutshell. Like, his lyrics, yeah. like, ignorant lyrics, they're smart, though. Yep. That, that's, that's, that's one of the, also one of the lines when I was like, mm, okay, yeah. Hey, your baba, hey, uh, hey. Um, yeah, in your what baby mama crib, like not flushing like after a piss. Uh, yeah, and he ends it on the line about being high like Pac Bandana. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep, so good, yeah. Um, excellent. Um, I think blunt that, after- like, this track, like, this goes into, um, this goes into uh, Outer Space or Blunt After Blunt, I forget. This or- blunt After Blunt, yeah. Blunt which After is- Blunt goes into Outer Space, goes into Adderall Admiral. And it's kind yeah. of like, this is just the party creep. Like, everybody's left the party, but Danny's still smoking and rapping to himself, kind of. Like, that's how I and, see it. And then he starts thinking about shit, and that's when DNA happens. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, uh, yeah. Um, blunt after blunt, it's like, it's like a weed track, but it's like the most menacing, snow, uh, slow and, like, unsettling yeah. weed anthem. Danny and then the two scariest weed tracks ever in Blunt After Blunt and Kush Kala. Yeah. Yeah, this is like blunt after blunt after blunt. It's like this, like and I not, smoke. Yeah, <laughs> it like there's nothing chill about it. There's nothing relaxed about it. It's like, but it's almost like, of course, that's it's almost like the point um, of it. And of course, you know, not just talking about weed, but he's talking about zannies and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Right, um, I think that's part of the point. The overall point of the narrative too is like you know it's a weed song, but really he as the narrator is like so much more fucked up, and yeah. he's trying to chill. Like, and at the end he can't chill, and that's why he's like, all, like he's strung off, all, strung out off Adderall. Yeah, and it's funny. Uh, blunt after blunt and outer space uh, apparently both influenced. Um, he said he wanted to get a Def Jux sound because um, he's a he's a big fan of of those guys too. Um, yeah, Ox I, I and LP. And... I, trying, I mean, I didn't really. I definitely didn't hear it off Adderall Admiral. I kind of hear it off one after Blunt. Like I hear the paranoia. Like he definitely nails like that LP style paranoia, albeit in a different way. Like L nails it by like saying a lot of shit and making his lyrics very busy. Danny can be paranoid by making it slow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, it, it's much. It's it, well, it's not exactly fantastic damage, but I can sort of see the um, cold vein possible comparisons. Maybe um, um, possibly also Alaska's um, group Hangar Eighteen. They they had a little bit I of that. More, I haven't heard them yet. Yeah, so it's it's Alaska and Wind and Breeze. They have a bit more of a um, fun and more electronic electro kind of sound um that's kind of i haven't listened to a, a ton of them but it's kind of similar to this um but yeah uh, uh just going a little bit quicker but yeah, adderall admiral that is almost entirely built off of one sample it's funny how you said like it sounds like a lot going on but um uh i had i i really got into an album because of the sample so it samples this band called this heat uh, which is like an 80s 90s industrial rock experimental yeah i thought it was black sabbath <laughs> yeah yeah it's i do and, and, it was black sabbath I, I i don't know why but yeah 
I thought it was three separate samples, but it's from one song. And the original song, like it, it sounds like almost um, like they didn't do that much change to it, to be honest. But the original song is well, incredible. That's reason this is one of my favorite albums ever in the same way as Mad Villainy is that the way that Danny, and I think this is Danny in the same way Mad Lib worked with Mad Villainy, because I don't think Doom had that much to do with Mad Villainy beyond rapping. Like, I think Doom yeah. was just kind of there, like, they chilled and he did the verses. But beyond that, in terms of the construction of the album, that was all Mad Lib. And maybe Egon was like, or maybe Wolf was around for it at points. But in terms of, like, the structuring of this album, I think producers sent Danny beats and Danny assembled this album. Like, I don't know if yeah. he EP credit on this or whatever, but it, this very much feels like this was his... Like, if you read that Weiss interview, transitions were very important to him. Telling a story was very important to him. I feel like if you listen to any of his albums, the transitioning is very deliberate. So, yeah. Yeah, he is a very album-centric but guy. One of which the things that's very um, appealing to me about this album, in the same way as Mad Villainy, is the vocal mixing. Like Dan, And it's more impressive to me with this album. I don't know if it's more impressive to me with this album than Mad Villainy, because Doom's voice is a lot less versatile than Danny's. But you feel like in both cases, their voice is all around you at a lot of points. Like you're always hearing their voice. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's like really prominent um, in the mix, I guess you could say. But um, and the samples too, the like beats. the samples you said that there were, you thought there were three different elements, really. Like, and that goes back to their it feeling like a one producer project, but there's five or six different producers on it. Yep, it's. The, yeah, the, it's super well thought out and cohesive. Yeah, it's just um, the, and and this is honestly what I think is uh, something that's really underrated and and starting to sort of become more and more underrated in hip hop and it also sort of goes back into what I was saying about artists who just flood their um oversaturate their their um the market with their content, where it's like no, sit down, focus, um, li- um, curate something for yourself. Don't be afraid to leave stuff on the cutting room floor and release things that will be evergreen and long lasting. Because really, in the future, um, singles are singles, um, mixtapes are mixtapes, uh, compilations are compilations, whatever. But what really stands the test of time is what really people come back to is albums. What people make lists of greatest of this, and then the main thing people are looking for is albums. So, like, I don't understand why a lot of artists, they don't really sit down and focus on releasing and curating like their albums and like like in Danny Brown like you know release an album every three years what well, that's that's perfectly fine it, it's much more evergreen but I guess the reason why is because of streaming and the the model has changed where like you get paid more for a number of plays and you know you got flavor of the month stuff and things well, people have um, said that wants- since the 80s though I feel like that was like even the 70s I feel like the double album well I feel like people, I mean, people can obviously correct me. No one ever does, except for Makami fans. Correct me in the comment thread, and even then, they're probably wrong. I'm sure I could look back at the GAT credits and tell you there was one knowledge. But anyway. Um, trip, trip. <laughs> anyway, but, you know, um, I feel like the double album was a corrective to the whole 50. Like, the 50, like, music essentially was a singles thing. I think albums were just compilations of singles at first, right? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, the double album was an artistic statement. Like, ultimately, like, record labels would care to produce singles, right? Like, they sell more, like, that's a more, that's a unit shifter, right? So, that, yep. and now streaming is just... Like Spotify is just ultimately the music industry's way of finally dealing with the problem they had 25 years ago with Napster. Yeah, and and I so I guess it is sort of that uh, that awkward um, uh, middle point between business and art, uh, where like yeah, sorry, we want to make artistic statements and all this, but we also got to make a living out of this, and to make these artistic statements, we need to do. We don't have a regular nine to five, so we got to make money off of this. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a big conversation, but um, but I but guess yeah. one of the big things that really resonated with me with this was when he released this, Watch the Throne came out, which is how we transitioned to this, and that was an album you couldn't find leaking. Period. Like Jay mm. and Kanye had that shit like under a gold safe. Danny mm. released this for free. The disparity mm. couldn't be more great, and I like Watch the Throne. I don't really spin mm. Watch the Throne that often, and when I do, it's like this is fun. But when I spin triple X like I did today, it still fucking hits me in the heart. Like, there's something to be said for that. And I think, and like, he released this for free. 
I don't know if you can still get it for free, but I'm pretty sure um, you can. It looks like the fools. Yep. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe yeah. not. I mean, if he deserves money for it, I would pay him money for it. Like I've certainly listened to it enough, but like I mean, I've paid but Danny money for. I think this was the last one he released for free. Hybrid was definitely free. Hot Soup came out for free. Detroit State of Mind, for, Detroit State of Mind Four was a mixtape. Uh, Black and Brown might have been a pay release. I don't remember. Um, but still, like it was just the disparity of it in terms of something super hype that was like flaunting its wealth versus something that was like a dude talking about how he ate a lunchable for dinner. Mm. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. That's yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is. Um, it, to me, like, yeah, the, the whole having like a purpose and, and the fact that like, this was the initial release of free and it was called the mixtape. And this was around the same uh, time where, uh, mixtape, the definition was getting redefined and ill-defined at the same time. But like the fact that this was released for free, like it was like here, is this thing for free, but it's such a bold and cohesive statement and package. It's just well, incredible. we left off with Adderall Admiral, which he ends that with rewind this and just smoke to it. And I think the reason he says that is because if you want to keep this as a fun party album, even though it started getting less fun if you were really paying attention, you rewind here because then it turns into DNA. And this is when yep. the album takes the turn. Like, yep. Again, I said that it could be read a bunch of ways, but I think the way Danny really structured it for mass consumption was in two halves. And old is kind of structured as the reverse of this. Because mm. old has the the, con- the conscious, I'm making air quotes, that everybody loves when people make air quotes, it's not obnoxious at all. Um, you know, old has the more thoughtful content in the first half and the hype content in the second Triple X has the allegedly more hype content in the first half and the more introspective stuff in the second. And DNA is where the party finally crashes for Danny. And speaking of somebody who has used Adderall recreationally, yeah, that's when you start to like, it sucks when you come off of it. So this is something he did from experience, I feel like. And the music yep. sounds like that too. Like the way Adderall, Adderall, Admiral, son, Admiral, Admiral sounds strung out that sample sounds strung out it sounds desperate so when it goes into like uh dna just kind of has this like wistful sound to it like i don't know like adderall Adderall is like anxiety like you have outer space and like blunt after blunt is like you're too high and outer space is your woozy Adderall Admiral is you're strung out, and then DNA is kind of the introspection after all of that. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. The, the beat is Just definitely instrumentally, um, like lyrically. There's a lot more to unpack. I will say, I can't exactly figure out the song, uh, not necessarily in a bad way, because of course the hook is very explicitly saying one thing. You know, um, just talking about hereditary drug addiction and, and her- hereditary issues being in his like uh, mental issues, whatever, uh, that he can't help escape. But then the verses seem to be... The second verse is a little confused. The second verse is one of the less focused ones, I'll say. Yeah, it it seems like, yeah, like the first verse is sort of, it's painting this um, luxurious sort of lifestyle, but with this like an undercurrent of excess in it. Um, And the second verse is a little bit more abstract, but still kind of the same. Uh, But... He, it, it is a bit more that that excess becomes more of an undercurrent to like a bit more in the in, in like the focus of it um and i I'm, i guess the hook doesn't necessarily have to tie in directly with the song but it can still be part of like the a thematic tie-in um like or I like mean, a reinforcement is supposed to be the crash and i think there are thematic threads within the verses uh, the second verse, I think, is probably one of the weaker. Like, if you really want to get into the weeds about, like, what verses are the weakest on the album, that one kind of seems like he's losing the thread a little bit sometimes. He just kind of rambles into disraps where it seems like he should be more focused. But I'll, I will say, <laughs> uh, you're probably going to hate me for this, but that second verse, there is some syllable, miracle, miracle, typical Sphinx stuff that I just love. Like, Perceive if there's a villain, a sentinel, or a sentence, for instance, an instance. Oh, no, can do that. No, I love when people do that well. Like, I, like again, like, um, again, I've, mem- I've referenced this, I think, on the last one you were on. Um, uh, Project Polaroid, uh, Prince Poe does that on his feature. Like, 
I like when it's done well. I don't think I can deal with a whole album of that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, I think the closest you know, I can come is the second Ultramagnetic and some Keith stuff. Like, I think, I think Keith is the best at it because Keith has a personality about it. Yeah, but I, I don't necessarily think Danny this can is do it because Danny integrates it, and Danny will never do more than like half a verse of it. Yeah, but I don't necessarily think this is. Uh, I don't necessarily think this is like him I mean, flexing. You, think of, um, you didn't listen to Nihilist Millennial before the last episode, have you listened to it since? You've listened to it since, right? No, I, I've I've not listened to any. Oh, of it. Okay, well, god damn it, fuck off. Because that was almost, the, like, because he actually does like. I think that's a kind of spiritual lyrical miracle album in a little bit of a way, and I think he does that style very well in a modern sort of sense. And I really love that album, and so that kind of disproves your fucking argument. But you didn't listen to it, so no, uh, stupid. But I, okay. I will. No, it's cool. I will get around, I'll get around to it, but I don't listen sure to music okay. very often anymore. But yeah, but I guess what I'm saying by. What, what I'm saying by lyrical milk, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm, I'm sort of being tongue in cheek, but um, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, it, it, you know, on surface, it is a lot of like, um, you know, multisyllabic internal rhyming, all that sort of stuff. But I mean, um, that's yeah. on Detroit 187 too. But it's like the way he, like, what I like about when Danny does it is that he does it in the sort of way where it's like, you know, sometimes it's just for the love of how it sounds, and then he makes a point, and then he makes a joke, and then it's like. And that's what rapping is at its best. It's like you're able to just like fucking throw on a goddamn show. And it's like you can make jokes, you can make points, you can just hold a fucking audience with it. Like the best rappers can just do a bunch of things at once. Like I'm not yeah. impressed about Kendrick, but Kendrick's so fucking goddamn serious about it sometimes and impressed with himself. And like there's an yeah. actual, you know, to use a Kendrick term, humbleness to Danny on this album. And you wouldn't think somebody who raps about his dick gives a chick stretch marks on her jaw is very humble but you know there's an actual earthiness to danny on this album there is but but yeah like like even even sort of like what uh these that the second verse on dna like there is he's still like it, it, it is going back to that like jumping from one thing to another where it's like for like he says something really poignant and really sort of sad and then he he's bragging and yeah like he's talking about self-serve rappers but then he's saying self-serve rappers hide behind your reverb um and then you, you know so it, you expect you'll end up these are yes yeah, so it's it's like it's still braggadocia and then he's talking about you know latin bitch fat ass well proportioned thighs love coming and squirting ass so it's like he's it's and that's why like i don't know i, I like the song but i still find it strange and like it's a bit well, I mean, over like, the place he really focus. starts out like talking about himself and then he just goes into brag raps that's what i find to be a little disconcerting about that particular verse is where it's like i feel like he started writing the song about something and then he ran out of like normally he has a balance in it and it kind of felt like the balance was off but the first verse is more on like an entire topic and the second verse is like it starts out about the topic where he's talking about himself warhol's all in the ball of the villa adderall and got me jumping to the ceiling perceived as a villain no sentiment in my sentence for instance and instance they'll be calling forensics like yeah that's him first of all that's totally doom second of all that's yes. him like reflecting on himself talking about his like substance issues and how people perceive him then he just talks about how rappers are whack yeah he, he it's kind of strange that the song like where the hook is you know it's in my DNA because my mom's used to get fucked up the same way and then he, uh, yeah, the second verse he ends it with to describe your mixtape. That shit was a toothache. Um, so it's like, oh, well, yeah. And, and the fact that, like, this is the start of side B, and yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I guess if there is a flaw. Yeah, I guess, yeah, if there is a flaw, it's that, like, this had, like, the absolute right I concept and hook and beat for what he's going for here, especially with the next two songs. But the fact that that second verse. Like, the balance is off between the first and second verses here. Like, he could have probably taken these lyrics and rewritten them between the two verses into something that would have worked for this. Because the first verse feels front-loaded with the introspective material. Because he's good at balancing, generally, between, like, the you suck and here's what I, how I feel about myself shit. Yeah, yep, yeah. It, it's, I guess, and this is maybe why it's a... Uh you know, mixtape instead of an album, but yeah, I mean, everything else is so cohesive um, that I guess things should be held up to a standard that he has set himself with so other tracks. 
Like, I mean, yeah, that's what this is for, though. We're doing deep dives. Like, yeah, I agree. Like, I kind of did think that when I was listening to it. I was like, the second verse is like, oh, you've kind of lost the thread there a little bit. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I, I, I was looking at it as a shallow of, um, I just love the rhymes. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but no, on a shallow, like, but even then, like, on a shallow level, the rhymes are fucking great. Like, it's only on the deeper level of this is telling a story about Danny and a character. Like if you look at it on the second layer, then it kind of fails it. But on a pure level of dude rapping, it doesn't fail it whatsoever. The raps. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't a hundred percent fit the puzzle in the overall picture. Like, um, but the piece doesn't fit in the overall puzzle, um, as much as the next tracks, like nose bleeds and priority all the time, which sort of, Kind of goes hands in hands. Um, oh, yeah, definitely similar. a mirror. I think we kind of covered these earlier where I was kind of like nosebleeds is a first person picture and party all the time is Danny looking at the character that he rapped about in the previous song from his own perspective. But really what he's rapping about is also transferring his feelings about himself. I like how the the beats are contrasting, like what how shoes does on nosebleeds to party all the time, which is Brandon Deshay, I believe. And um, yep, it's both beats are gorgeous. The rapping is very different on both. The way Danny raps on nosebleeds, I don't think you really hear an analog to that anywhere else in his catalog. And I've heard more than you have, but like that just like downcast tone in his voice that he hits, just there's something about that that hits what he's trying to tell you about the girl in the story. Yeah, and yeah, and just the fact that like even the transition from Adderall Admiral to DNA, even if the lyrical um, subject matter is not a hundred percent sort of flip from one to the other just yet. Um, uh, but yeah, the voice is like, you know, from hey, you know, the Adderall, wash it down with alcohol to like, um, you know, party all the time. or like, it's in my DNA. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what's great about daddy's voice is that his versatility is so much that he doesn't get credit for this. Like he's actually kind of slagged for it, but yeah, that's what makes those shifts. So like deliberate and effective. And then you get yeah. like nosebleeds where, that nothing else on the record sounds like this. And when he has that last line about blood running down her lips and then the strings come in, dude, that's fucking like that hits different. That's fucking hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't really have much to say about these two tracks just other than the, like, yeah, they're, they were excellent and they, um, well placed and, and fit each other, um, very well together. And, yeah. Then we come into my least favorite tr- track. Um, east but side, east side, east side. Th- okay, this hook is growing on me. Um, but even well, this beat, all, I think, I, is I meh. Who told me that this is the one where it comes in with the line about St. Pat's, which is like everybody. One of the th- like I had the line about Raven Max saying that what makes a great rap album is every line could make a good scratch. And somebody, well, what I think is that what makes a great rap album is that you can pick up for everybody else can, everybody can pick a verse and pick a different favorite line. And I didn't mm. even realize this line was the beginning line. I was born one day before St. Pat, I guess, a uh, miss luck just like that. Yeah, that that's an incredible. <laughs> um, and again, Danny couple. knows how to start a fucking verse. Even on the songs you think are lesser than other songs, he will grab you by the fucking collar. Yep. Yeah. And, and just the fact that like, yeah, he was one. He was born one day before St. Patrick's Day, and he, it just coincidence. But then he managed to tie that in to like you know the whole you know look at the he Irish does, thing, uh, Hen- the Henry Ford reference or Henry Ford to Motown. Like the way he works in references, dude. Like some people are so lazy with references. Like Game uses references just to know that you know he knows somebody or he knows when something exists. Like yep. the way Danny uses references, Henry Ford has a specific reference point to that area. So does Motown. That's soul. That's machinery. That's he's calling back to something right there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it it's still um not a big fan of even though it's well, Chris, n- not a big fan of the beat, not a big fan of Hook, but well, yeah, the, the verses. I mean, the beat is probably the least the beat that does the least on the album, except for radio song and radio song is deliberately not doing much. Um, but yeah, I this like is it for what it doesn't do. Almost is the notes that they don't play to call back to the <laughs> previous episode. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's lo-fi, but I really love the exhausted way. Danny plays the hook again. Like I really can't like, I mean, this and I will are the worst songs on the album and they're still 
great songs to me. Like, I'm sorry. Like, you're not going to find me saying shit about this album is bad. I love mm. this fucking album. This this track, the lyrics on it are so, like, the fucking details on here are so evocative. Like, they're what give context to the bragging elsewhere. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's a, that's a perfect way of putting it. And, yeah. Um, more and more, I'm, war- I'm warming up to the hook because I realize, like, I mean, I always knew like what it what it was sort of trying to say and how it tied in but it also does sort of reinforce that like it reinforces the, the the verses which is what a good hook does and like the whole like you know uh, one he's thing talking i about. just realized reading the genius lyrics right now when he says stick a fork in it where's the enforcement i just liked before what i realized is how much how great that sounds fork in it enforcement that's a great assonant rhyme um that's a pig. That's like a nice little like fucking reference to cops being pigs. Stick a fork in it like a pig. It's done. Oh, OK. Like stick a fork in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, this guy's. Yeah. He's a smart nigga who does dumb he's, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, nah, he is. Yeah. No, nah, he's um very, very well thought out stuff. No, nah, it's just this is like a grainy snapshot of a neighborhood. It's yeah, um, like and it's just like his childhood his album. It's like my music's like looking at your old photographs. Like this is like him looking at an old photograph. That's what I get out of this and Fields and Scrapper Die. Like yep. he saw like essentially like the album is like he parties really hard and he gets strung out and then he sees a girl and that's those two tracks and then the next three are him looking at his old photographs and reminiscing because he's about to turn thirty so he flipped the fuck out. And that's yep. this album's narrative to me. And then he ends by having a fucking panic attack and thinking he's going to die. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost like he, yeah, he's reminiscing, or it's like almost like his his life is his life is starting to flash before his eyes. Um, you know, starting from his childhood, um, to like you know it, where he grew up with the fields, and then you know being bo- being questioned from because I think he grew up in one side of Detroit, and then he. He was born in one side of Detroit, and then he went to school in another side of Detroit, and you know people would, you know. But they didn't always tell him where it's be fields because it's like they took all the scrap metal because they had to to survive. He says that in there. He's like, I tell you, that's why. We had to yeah. It, yeah. Just, just how things are put together. Like it's just genius, and there's no other album that I can think of where it's like so purposeful no, but I not think it's corny. So much about the American condition as a whole, if you really want to extrapolate upon it like that. Like, yeah, and just on a purely sonic level, it's just, I mean, just but track by track, like, yeah, East Side is like it's lyrical, it's downbeat, like he rhymes downbeat on it. I can see why the hook is a little deflating for people because it's a deflated hook, but yeah, but I, I also do want to say about the hook, I the what sort of made me warm up it is like the contrast, like, was like you're from the East Side, as like someone is asking him. Um, so that's why he does have voice. And then his he reinforced by saying, East side, east side, almost like a like a gang like um call out, like you know, west side, east side, like like there's okay. a pur- there's a purpose for why he's repeating it. And the more more I thought like about on, that. Uh, like, the next album when he's on his way to get Wonder Bread, like he's like telling a story, he has to like explain where he's going. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. So it, there's a purpose to it too, yeah. Um and then Fields, um Love oh, that. I song. love Fields. Oh my God. Uh that is that is maybe like that's top ten, top five. Like money talk only broke people listen, ain't got a put to piss in too poor to pay attention. That's like he encapsulates a fucking world in that fucking opening four. Yeah, and I just love how yeah, like he uses like three sort of um uh common sayings about being Poor, you know, money talk only broke people listen, you know. But I got, yeah, I, he I, like I try, he like kind of to pay attention and makes them work. And then, like, I also love the way Paul White uses like a extended reverb on that hook to make it seem farther and farther away when he says yep. house field 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 house abandoned house field field like yeah like yeah like really and, encapsulating Danny like just kind of looking at where things used to be and what they are now. Yep, and 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 once again, like the hook has a purpose for that repetition. Like, um, it's it's almost like him being in a car, or him walking from block to block, and it's like, oh, that's a field, field house, abandoned house, field, field. Like, yeah, just amazing. And the, the, the time and place in both instrumental and lyricism. 
Yep, and of course, um, uh, the hook uh, has the sample of um, from from uh, you've seen Akira, right? Yes, yes. I actually mentioned that in my log that I can't believe that I missed that in my initial review. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that Akira soundtrack is one of my favorite albums of all time. That I think the specifically Akira Symphonic Suite. It's by this group called Gino Yamashi Rogumi, and they're like this Japanese music collective that combine Japanese classical folk music with like electronic new age music and Indonesian, um, uh, folk music. Um, but yeah, I love that soundtrack and just the use of it here, like with those like wind chimes or, um, or, um, whatever the hell it is, just incredible. I mean, like, it, it has like either like, uh, wind chime or some sort of eastern to you a catch all term that I instrument that I can't place it's yeah it sounds very far like increasingly far away as it goes which is appropriate for the song yeah it's it's almost like when they they play like you know the sound effects or something for like a dream sequence or like a, a flashback sequence in a, in a movie or a tv show um like and well, and, and I'm pretty sure like a proceeding, but Danny is still like immediate. And I'm pretty sure that specific sample, that specific section of that song, is is used in the scene Akira, where um, where um, both Akira um, is 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 like flashing back to his childhood, and also it is in another scene where um, um, Canada um, is reminiscing back on his childhood. It's so, like. It's there's a purpose even in using that sample um, in the song. Like it, it's God it's damn, just layers man. of genius. That's yeah. layers on layers, man. That's wheels within wheels. Fuck. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I didn't even realize that. It's just yeah, that song just hit me the way that like, and again, it's like the the way Danny is able to like contort his voice in sort of subtle ways where he says like there there's now how where like abandoned fields where there used to be like jobs and businesses at the very end he sounds so exhausted like he's trying like he speeds up his flow but he also sounds exhausted at the very end of it and then and where i live and like it just comes in with that the sample comes back in like it crowds it like his thoughts are crowded like his like nostalgia is crowding his narr- like his inner monologue yeah and, and yeah just like just like his his use of like uh, specific words, like when it says, uh, "Living in the system, working k- kitchen for chump change, lost in the streets, niggas playing the gun the gun, gun game. game." Yeah, where nobody wins, but just a mom- bunch of moms losing. A lot of moms losing. Yeah, yeah. You're like, damn. Yeah, the dead like, body yeah, in the field, that body is like, shooting. Break things down to very simple terms sometimes. And yeah, it's like, yeah. You start it with him using a lot of references, but once you get to this point in the album, he's breaking it down to very simple terms. Yep. Yeah. When he's partying, he's using references, but when he breaks it down to his own life, he's using simple terms. Yep. Yeah. W- which also, I guess, transitions into the next track, "Scrap or Die." This is a really, really, really good storytelling track. I, I was and the, um, really the reading... only traditional story. On, I mean, I guess you could talk about party all the time being a traditional story, but that with nosebleeds kind of feel like a different thing to me. This is just like the one like rap story on the song on the album, I think, kind of like a narrative, like like a, it starts off as a story about we're going to do something. And we do something. Yeah, and this is explains really... again, like what happened in the previous song. Yeah, this is and it's it's super straightforward and but really like vivid, um, like, you know, he's talking about going to the crib and then he's breaking into um, like his 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 you've seen The Wire, right? Yeah, I've seen The Wire, but I've also, um, what I actually thought about with this was, um, have you um, ever seen the film Jesus' Son? No, I haven't. Um, it's based on a book by Dennis Johnson, which is about a heroin addicts, and that, that's how they would get their money. Again, like, this is about dope addicts getting their money, they would rip copper wiring. And I first yeah. heard about that, like, this, the first time I heard about this practice was when I saw about this movie, I would really watch... Uh, I was a devoted watcher of the Siskel and Ebert's movie show and a movie about this came out in 1998. So the first time I saw this, there was a clip of people ripping copper wiring out of houses in this indie film. So that's kind of what I associate with this song, but it seems like more evocative than anything from the film, anything from the book, like anything that I've heard about this on the wire period, like this song evokes it better than any of those. Yeah. This like, I was specifically thinking of um, Dookie, Duke one. 
Um, yeah, yes. And his story. Um, and yeah, how he's pretty much scrapping. Um, like, especially the first verse where he's talking about, like, it seems like his, uh, yeah, his uncle who's like, you know, sniffing blow and rolling blunts and and smoking crack. And, and then, like, he's going with someone and he's like, you know, take everything, nigga, fuck the landlord and they're stealing and and all that sort of stuff. And then the second verse, of course, ends up with them um, getting um, uh, caught by put the police and breaking in everything. Like, it's super simple and super straightforward, but, like, super effective at the same time. I mean, and of course, also, yeah. that's kind of how, like, he kind of blows that narrowed up on old where uh, about his own life, where it ends with him getting, you know, his whole story, he gets arrested and then he blows up. And that kind of like, yeah, the first half where he's hustling is that sort of music. It's like more str- quote unquote traditional music. And the second mm-hmm. half where after he's blown up, it's more quote unquote EDM music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, he kind of takes this theme and blows it up later on on the next album so this is also foreshadowing but yeah on this out it's just very like the beat is so like it's minimal again but it's detailed and being minimal yeah and the beat almost sounds like it fits this it's almost it's um it's like a scene in a movie where like characters like sneaking around it's like like almost sounds like sneaking around music sort of like heist getting away with something thing and then you have the jeezy ad libs dipping in like yeah and i love that the rework of the trap would die uh like covered by the pound wire by the inch and yeah, same the flat, rusty flat bed truck, the same color of doo doo. I was like, I don't even know. Of course, you know, you know. Yeah, you know, you're not, not exactly my favorite. The experts, so you probably couldn't like you know cite the source material on this, but no. Nope. Yeah, it's but he definitely reworked something to a different purpose on this song. Yeah, yeah. Without without it being like a um. No, it doesn't feel like ironic winking either. Like, no, no. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not it's not like it it's it's still you know respectful or whatever it's it's a clever rework but you know taking something and giving it putting it in like a different context sort of bringing it a little bit more um down to earth in a way but yeah respectfully well, um, which brings us to I think that he kind of saw that as his lowest moment of having to be around that or do that or be that grimy and now he is where he is and kind of synthesizing everything at the very end. And he doesn't think that he's going to survive it because he's done all these drugs. And now he's 30 years old and he's having a fucking panic attack and it's all Mm. crashing down upon him at the very end. And this is, I don't know if this is my favorite album ending ever. When I listened to it today, it felt like it. And every time Mm. I listen to it, it feels like it. It just feels like, I mean, this seems cliched, but there's that scene at the end of Fight Club, which is a movie I really don't have much use for anymore, where everything blows up at the end. I don't really have much use for that scene either because I think it's been misappropriated. But the way that (laughs) instrumental sounds, sounds like that scene is supposed to feel, if that makes Mm. sense. It sounds like everything is blowing up around you. It sounds like everything is exploding and and or imploding or just is like destroying around you. And when it's like paramedics chest pumping and 30 off appeals like and his flow is just getting more intense and skywalker switches it up it's just everything about this is just so nothing else sounds like it and it just feels like everything in this album he's like spitting literally putting his whole fucking life out there synthesizing it and spitting it and having a goddamn panic attack and you shouldn't enjoy this because it's terrifying but it's amazing yeah, this I, I kind of wanted to say if you have to listen to one Danny Brown song, it's this. But at the same time, like you don't, it's almost like you need the whole context to understand this. But yeah, that the the Skywalker beat like starts off like it starts off with like it's almost as if it's like building from like scratch, like dun 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 dun. dun, dun, dun. It's almost like like someone is like being like being revived or something or. Like it, it's something like struggling to like start up, like a person like struggling to get up. But then it just encapsulates everything about like what we were, were saying and everything about Dana Brown and this album. Where he's like, first line is like, send the bitch a dick pic and now she get glasses. Turn your bitch to the creek right I now. Know, if I flash it, it. right after that, <laughs> ate a couple pills, took the butt out of the plastic. Yeah, stay blasted. And then like yeah. as as he escalates, and then eventually he has to face himself. Yeah, and that, and then like, 
his, his first two lines is about you know um, sex sex um, uh, brags, and he has the cartoonish voice, and then he talks about drugs in sort of a quote unquote positive way, but then he's bragging about his mag, uh, mic skills, you know, microphone caches. Um, but then he writes it right after that. He says, and even his brags be- like magic with the six shit. But then, like magic with the six shit. First of all, that's offensive as fuck. You know. <laughs> yeah. And then, <laughs> and then, but then it's dark as fuck. Supposed to have been dead, but bitch, I'm still up in this bitch. Like, and he, he switches his voice for that part. Yeah. He's like, but and yeah, like the switching of his voice on this. By the way, like that's just like I don't think I've ever heard a rap song where I've heard so many flow switches and everyone is just like, I. I got no words for it, man. Burble, burble, poison. Words are a boy. And like some of the shit he says is just like, like half of this shit is just bragging, but the other half is harrowing. Straight up. Yeah. Harrowing. And, and the transition is like, like when you read it, it's abrupt, but then when you listen to it, it's, you don't notice necessarily. I mean, his voice is changing and everything, but it flows seamlessly between the different voices, the different um, flows, the different rhyme schemes, um, and the different um, subject matter. Like, um, yeah. Um, and and uh, uh, another thing that I realized, because I always thought he just mispronounced abortion, but then before that, he says words, I contortion, and, and then says, fuck a figure bitch for saving money on her abortion. Yeah. Like he's it's it's sort of like he's you know it's making a little joke because um, because before that he says verbal horrible poison like he's bragging about his rapping but then he, one of the first fights I had with my wife I made a joke and she said you can't make jokes when we have fights and I was like why and she was like because we're being serious and like I'm trying to deflate the tension and I think that's mm. what Danny tries to do in this shit I think that's what sometimes weird people try and do in these circumstances is and I think that's kind of I don't know. That was just a thought I had right now. It probably doesn't make sense. No, no, I, I totally understand. And, and and that's exactly what it's doing. It, it, it's, you know, people are multifaceted and then, uh, yeah, like, and then just like he sort of just continues, like, like, to be honest, Billy uh, no. organ, a church playing organ, <laughs> covering two short, smoking a yep. new part. All right. So, again, I, yeah. I Make the pain I'm actually it. showing remarkable restraint in not doing that much Danny voice on this episode. Why it's listening to it, be like, no, you're not. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to resist. Yeah, um, I've, you have no idea how much I've been fighting the urge to not, yeah, yeah, do the voice every single time. But yeah, there is something blackmail. Oh, yeah, Danny wants to prescribe, but yeah, and, and but it's like it's blind. super dark. Like yeah, left left behind a daughter and. But yeah, like think about what we're singing along to, dude. Think about what we're singing along to. Yeah, and And his mother thought he couldn't make a living off of poems. Like that's just like he's really spitting some of the realest shit I've ever heard. I actually can relate my own life to that too, where it's just like I had to compromise because I couldn't make a living artistically, and so I had to eventually find some other outlet for it. So I look back to this, and it's like. So did he, like, I mean, but he actually did, like, mm. but he was with somebody who wasn't with him, who wouldn't believe in him. Like, my wife would have supported me in any artistic outlet I would have done, but he was with somebody who was like, no, you can't do that. Mm. Um, again, like, it's just, this probably isn't making sense again, but this album does resonate with me on a lot of levels as, like, artistically and personally, and that's why it works. And I think it probably works better than Madbility on that level. Mm. Because, yep. like, Mad Villain is a bit more specific, and like, um, Mad Villain yeah. is better aesthetically, I would think. Like, Mad Villain is like perfect, like, thread count level type thing, where it's like not a thread out of place. There are a mm. lot of threads out of place on this album, but they're to its benefit. Yeah, it's almost like perfect in its imperfections in a way. Uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, to be honest, uh, this track, um, and like. That first of all, um, the changing beat, con- the constant changing beat, the constant change of voice, the changing flow, changing lyrical subject matter, and the smooth changing between all of those stuff. This is why, like, I feel like this track is better than anything on um, Atrocity Ex- Exhibition. By I mean, by I agree with Trust. I agree with you. I I think there are a lot of tracks on here that are better than anything on Atrocity Exhibition. I feel like I'm talking a lot of shit on Atrocity Exhibition. I think that's an outstanding album. It just doesn't mm. hit me like this. It just doesn't. yes. I'm sorry. It just doesn't. Yep, we'll get to it, but um, yeah, I think we share the exact same sentiments on that. Um, but yeah, um, 
I don't know if there's much else to say on this. I just love the the, the constantly changing beat. Like it's an it's like an evolving instrumental, which I think it's mainly built out of this metronomy sample. I, I listened to a little bit of that, the, the but dun, still, dun, dun, it works. Dun, 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 but he keeps putting piling more distortion on it. It's probably just a really simple effect filter he's putting on it, but he makes it work so well. Skywalker, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's just a perfect also, way to end. Also, when Danny Brown says the last 10 years, I've been so fucking stressed, tears in my eyes, i got to get this off my chest, the fears of no success have a chase in death, like, that, if you can't relate to that, just go fuck yourself. I don't care if you listen to this podcast or not, just go fuck yourself. Like, I relate to that really hard, so, yeah. The, and I did voice? that, and I do now more now, and, like, the, the way he hits that is just without any pretension whatsoever, like it's just so genuine. Like that's not punk rock. That's not hip hop. That's just humanity. Yeah, and his voice is like you can actually hear it sort of almost sort of cracking when it's like the last ten years I've been so so fucking fucking stressed. Yeah, it like yeah yeah yeah. It's 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 incredible. Like um the the chaining like the, it, it, like this track sort of recontextualizes the entire album and it gives it purpose. Like. Like, you can't listen to, like, people who listen, when Danny Brown first came out, I remember, 2011, 2012, 2013, people were like, his voice is annoying. Uh, he raps about his dick. This is stupid. Uh, two out of five, something like that. Um, just like, you, oh my God, that pissed me off so much. But it's like, how can you listen to this track and not get it? Like, how can you listen to this whole song? You know, sit down, listen to it a couple of times. How can you listen to this and then go back and be like, oh yeah, this album, uh... His voice sounds annoying, and he's you know quote unquote misogynistic. Um, this album's terrible. Like, and this and and part of this is the newer part of it is the old head fans, but also part of it is this new fans that came in with you know the. Well, they just want to. I mean, they just want to party all the time. Like the other thing is like you have the half yeah. the fans that don't like the voice, and the other half that just want to hear the that just want to hear the party shit. Like, and mm-hmm. you know what. I don't give a fuck. I that the mission statement of this podcast is we did a podcast about Carly Rae Jepsen and then we did a fucking podcast about DJ Screw. I guarantee you there is zero percent Venn diagram on either of those. We just fucking listen to what we like to listen to, and that is why we are living off borrowed time because we're all going to die pretty soon. So we might as well just enjoy our time here. Better Spinks, thank you for joining us. Our outro music yep. is Stagnated Pace by Can Kick, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Time will dawn upon us.